On day one, I spawned in as a Lego man. Looks like I'm a baby Lego man. Figures. Wait, it looks like the whole Minecraft world is made out of Lego. That's amazing. I looked around the desert I'd spawned into and saw other Lego people walking around. All villagers, by the looks of it. I've never seen anything like this. What's going on here? Allow me to explain, Lego Zozo. I turned and saw a more sinister Lego man with a scary looking helmet and a business suit. He didn't look friendly. Uh -oh. I'm Lord Business, soon to be the new manager of this Lego world. I'm gonna keep things clean, orderly, and most importantly, profitable. That doesn't sound so bad. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention, to make profits, you need to cut costs. And I'm gonna cut costs by destroying all those who oppose me. Starting here! He swung his hammer, and suddenly the desert was filled with explosions, tearing into the ground and blowing up all the Lego villagers around me. Just like that, I was all alone. I'm not gonna let you get away with this, Lord Business. I will defeat you. Lord Business just laughed and stomped over towards me. I've got a tight business plan, Zozo. I'll have control of this entire world in 100 days. And unless you become a master builder, you'd have no hope of stopping me. And it's not like that's gonna happen. I wanted to fight back and defend myself, but I was just a baby and I didn't have any weapons. Uh -oh. That's when a swarm of soul vultures appeared and started chasing me. All I could do was run. There's only one way out of this. I need to figure out what exactly a master builder is and become one in 100 days so I can defeat Lord Business and stop him from taking over the world. On day two, after running for hours and hours, I ended up leaving the desert and entering the savanna. I may not have any weapons yet, but at least I'm tough. Five Lego hearts? Even my health and hunger bar look like Lego pieces. Wow. And I'd need those Lego hearts because I still hadn't lost Lord Business's gang of nasty soul vultures. They were tough and fast, and I still didn't have any gear to fight them off with. Don't you guys have something better to do than hassle a baby Lego man? As the soul vultures got closer, I could feel my energy depleting. It was almost nightfall, and now I was really in trouble. Then, flaming arrows went flying through the sky. Someone was shooting at the soul vultures. The flames scared them, and the flock retreated. Someone had saved my life. That's when I saw a Lego villager hiding behind some cover. Thanks for saving my life, man. No problem. Name's Bruce. I'm part of the resistance against Lord Business and his evil plans. Wait, there's a resistance? Please let me in on it. I want to help defeat Lord Business too. Then you better follow me. It's dangerous to be around here at nightfall. Before we go, do you perhaps have any food? My Lego belly is starting to rumble. No problem, little man. Here are some cooked mutton Lego bricks. On day three, Bruce and I went to a village in the middle of the savanna. The village provides cover for the resistance. All the key members are hiding out here. None of us want Lord Business to turn this world into his personal piggy bank. Bruce took me to a secret building in the middle of town where he wanted me to meet the resistance leader, an Egyptian illager named Osiris, sitting in a chair in his private library. Wow. Everyone was gathered around the table, so I sat behind it as well. It's nice to meet you, Mr. Osiris. I'm Zozo. Bruce told me you're the leader of the resistance against Lord Business. This is true. Bruce told me you wished to join us. That's also true. Lord Business attacked me when I first spawned, and he told me he's gonna take over the world in the next 100 days. I could only stop him if I became something called a master builder. Osiris seemed shocked. He stood up and came walking towards me. A master builder? He said those exact words? Master builder? Yeah, but I have no idea what it means. Do you know anything about master builders, Osiris? Legends tell of the master builders. They're Lego men who have mastered the sacred art of construction. Through training and special techniques, they can build anything. Some say they're so good at building, they don't even need to use weapons to fight. They can use building itself as a weapon. Wow. I jumped with excitement. Oh my gosh, that sounds incredible. How can I become one? It won't be easy, but it's possible. It will take training in the art of building, of course. But most importantly of all, you must be taught the secret techniques by the four master builders hidden across the world. 
And if we are to have any hope of stopping Lord Business, you'll need to do all of this in less than 100 days. I waved goodbye and exited the secret building. On days four to five, I began my first pieces of work and training. After all, I couldn't even think about seeking the other master builders until I'd completed some basic training. Tools! First, I gotta make myself some tools. So I went over to the nearby trees and started gathering up some wood. It wasn't easy to punch through the trees, but soon enough, I had enough wood to make a crafting bench. And then, my first set of wooden tools. Yes. These look pretty cool, but a master builder needs better than wooden tools. Using my wooden shovel and pickaxe, I started digging into the ground until I hit stone and collected enough blocks to build myself a full set of stone gear, including tools and a sword. Because I was now an official part of the resistance, Osiris said I was allowed to build my base on the edge of the village, so I started using my spare wood and stone blocks to build the foundations of my base. The first step was building rooms for myself and Bruce, the Lego villager who had saved my life in the desert. It's always nice to have a friend living with you. Bruce hurried towards me, looking frantic. Zozo, the building is gonna have to wait. I can see a bunch of zombies creeping towards us out of the savannah. We need to stop them. Luckily, I had my new stone sword, so I pulled it out and ran in, ready to kick some moldy zombie booty. You're messing with a future master builder here. You're gonna regret this. And they did, because it didn't take me long to defeat the zombies and return to my base, glowing with victory. That's when I started to change. I upgraded, getting bigger, and gaining two hearts. Seven hearts? This is awesome! On day six through eight, I was wandering through the savannah until I reached a forest. I was collecting more wood for my base when I saw a wooden villager being attacked by this big and ugly looking bug called a sectoid. But the wooden villager was fighting back, building walls between him and the attacking sectoid. I've never seen anyone fight like this before. Maybe he's... That's when the wooden villager noticed me. Are you gonna stand there all day, son? Or are you gonna give me a hand with this thing? Oh, right, sorry. I ran in with my stone sword and joined the fight. The sectoid was tough, but with me and the wooden villager working together, we had a chance. Every time the sectoid tried to attack me, the wooden villager quickly built a little wall between us. Soon enough, the sectoid was exhausted and confused, and I was able to defeat it with my stone sword. He dropped some string. I guess it makes sense. He did look a bit like a spider. All that was left was me and the wooden villager. I wanted to know more about his special fighting skills. Thanks for the assist, kid. Who are you? I'm Zozo, and who are you? I'm Master Red. Wait, Master? As in Master Builder? Can you help me learn to be like you? Sure thing, kid. Your training starts now. You're gonna help me chase a soul eater out of a cave near here. Sounds like a plan, Master. Let's go. On days nine to 10, Master Ren and I made our way through the forest until we found the cave he told me about. Before we go in, Master Ren, what's the first lesson? How can I fight like a master builder? The first technique is the one you saw me using in the woods, kid. When your opponent tries to attack you, you build a wall between you and them. Okay, I think I'm ready. Let's do this. I followed Master Ren into the cave where the Soul Eater was waiting. It was even bigger and scarier than I thought it'd be. And the second it saw us, it flew towards us. Now is the time, Zozo. Try out the technique I taught you. But with the Soul Eater charging towards me, I panicked. I couldn't help it. I tried to build the wall between us as quickly as I could, but the Soul Eater just flew over the tiny barricade and started attacking me. In one strike, I lost a bunch of hearts. Uh-oh, I need to get out of here. I ran out of the cave and Master Ren followed me. I felt so embarrassed to lose in front of him like that, but he didn't seem to mind. Perhaps I will need to train you more cautiously, young Zozo. How about you come stay at my base? You can train me more there. That sounds like a good idea to me. On days 11 to 12, I returned back to my base with Master Ren and started adding another floor to the base. This way, he can have his own room. I hope this is to your liking, Master Ren. Well, it's clear you have much to learn in the way of building. But thank you, Zozo. It'll do. While Master Ren was resting up, I decided to put my building skills to good use. I created a custom crafting room where I could perfect my crafting skills and store my creations. By the time I was done, I saw that Osiris had arrived at my base, and he had something to tell me. How's the training going, Zozo? It's, uh, going. What's up? I figured it was finally time for me to tell you about what's really going on and why Lord Business is doing everything he's doing. 
You see, creativity is a wonderful thing, and it's a skill that all master builders are required to develop. But the purest kind of creativity is the kind used to make people happy. The darkest kind is the one that Lord Business has fallen prey to. Creativity to satisfy greed. All he cares about is money, and everything that people create, he seeks to own, and he's willing to destroy anyone who gets in the way of his bottom line. After hearing this story, I went out into the forest and gathered more sticks and wooden blocks. I made a little fenced up area in the backyard of my base and herded some cows into it, as well as making a small wheat farm alongside it. If I'm gonna become a master builder, I need to be able to build everything. On days 13 to 15, I approached Ren, who was practicing in an archery range I had built for him on the other side of the base. Hey Ren, I was wondering, do you know other ways I can improve my building abilities? Hmm, well, I suppose there is this handy tool I usually use. It's called a builder's wand, and it lets you build much faster by extending connected block faces. Huh? What? You didn't think to mention this before in the cave? Well, I have been known to be a bit forgetful here and there. Here, have one. Ren tossed out the wand for me. Thanks. Well, hopefully you can remember anything about master builders since, you know, you are one of them. Osiris said something about there being four master builders out there, and I've only found you. Hmm, perhaps your best bet is searching the snowy tundra. I've heard tales of mysterious buildings popping up there. It could be the work of a master builder. Then I guess the snowy tundra is exactly where I'm heading. Word of advice, Zozo. Build yourself a bow first. You never know when it'll come in handy for you. Before setting off for the snowy tundra, I tested out the builder's wand, and sure enough, it makes building walls much easier. This tool is really useful. I also followed Ren's advice and made myself a bow, just in case. All I needed were some feathers, and luckily there were a few chickens around, so I could craft the arrows as well. Better to have a bow and not need it, right? I made my way across the map to the snowy tundra. Part of me hoped I'd find the next master builder waiting for me, but it turned out that the snowy tundra was huge. It'd take me forever to find someone here. But it didn't take long for a mutant snow golem to find me and start attacking. You must work for Lord Business. Jeez, is there anyone outside the village who doesn't work for that guy? I tried my best to use Master Ren's technique, building walls in front of the attacking snow golem, but he was still too fast for me, even with the builder's wand. In the end, I kept my distance and finished him off with the bow. I don't know if I'm ever gonna be good enough to be a master builder at this rate. But the mutant snow golem did drop something, a builder's potion, which helps the speed of my mining and building. Wow. Just what the doctor ordered. I returned to my base and took the potion, practicing by digging a huge hole near my base and collecting a bunch of stone blocks. It was a good exercise because soon enough, I leveled up and gained two more hearts. Nine hearts? This is rad! On days 16 to 19, I continued exploring, hoping I might find another master builder hiding inside some ancient ruins. This place is so old and spooky, it seems just like the kind of place an old master would hang out. But I was half right. I didn't find a master builder here, but I did find an ancient sign that might lead me to one. It read, He who seeks to reach the peak of skill must climb to the peak itself. A master dwells where the air is thin. Hmm, thin air. Peaks? That sounds like a mountain. I know where I need to go now. But I couldn't celebrate too quickly. A group of Barracoa ancient people sent by Lord Business had cornered me. I needed to think fast. What would a master builder do? That's when I had an idea. Using all the stone I'd mined in the days before, I quickly ran around the group of Barracoa, building a wall around them that boxed them all in. It was quite tricky because they were surprisingly fast for their short stature. Eventually, I did succeed in boxing them in though. Before any of them had a chance to escape, I fled the ancient ruins, safe to fight another day. Master Ren is gonna be so proud of me. On days 20 through 22, I was making my way through the forest, gathering up materials to prepare for my journey into the mountain. These mountains are treacherous. I should really upgrade my gear before I go. While I was in the forest, some spiders attacked me. I was low on stone at the time, so I decided to defeat them with my stone sword instead of doing it the master builder way. Variety is the spice of life. Once the spiders were dealt with, I mined until I stumbled into a small cave system. I found some iron deposits. It took a while to mine all of it, but in no time I had enough to smelt and craft into a set of iron armor and tools. It made me feel so cool and powerful. Yes. 
Maybe it's time for me to pay my old enemy a visit. With my new tools and my new power, I went back to the cave where I had almost been defeated by the Soul Eater. But this time, it was going to happen the other way around. Come get me, Soul Eater. I'll give you something to chew on. I decided to go for a mix of standard and master builder tactics. As the Soul Eater flew towards me, I used my skill to quickly build a wall around the Soul Eater, trapping him in place. But there was no time to waste. I pulled out my new iron sword and one-shotted the Soul Eater right in the head. How do you like me now, you cave-dwelling meanie? Having fun, Zozo? I turned and saw Lord Business standing at the cave entrance and staring at me. Lord Business, what are you doing here? Watching your pathetic attempt to become a master builder. You really think you can make a difference? You're not special, Zozo. And believe me, when my factories are complete, we'll never need people like you to make anything ever again. And with that, he disappeared. Factories? That doesn't sound good. On days 23 to 26, I returned to my base, eager to tell Master Ren that I'd used my new skills to take down the Soul Eater. This is an amazing development, Zozo. I'm proud of you. Thanks, Master Ren. I couldn't have done it without your help. I have a reward for you. A special schematic for a new tool I've built. I think you'll find it quite useful. Master Ren gave me a book full of instructions, and I went into the crafting room to begin building. By the time I was done, I had a multi-tool. One tool that can be a pickaxe, a shovel, an axe, a sword, and a hoe. All in one. This is a perfect tool for a master builder. I then used my new iron multi-tool to clear the mess we did outside the base. I also used it to gather some more food. I then took some time to build a wall around my base. Now nobody with bad intentions could get in. On days 27 to 31, I decided to finally follow the instructions I saw in the ancient ruins. As I arrived at the ruins, I saw the Barracoa were gone, so I made my way up into the mountains. It was dark, cold, and difficult to climb, but it was worth it if it'd make me be a better builder. I couldn't see any mobs, thankfully, but I was so high up that if I fell, I probably would have been done for anyway. Then, without warning, an Iceman landed on the ground next to me. Who goes there? What? Where did you come from? That doesn't matter. Why are you invading my domain, stranger? I'm Zozo, and I swear I didn't mean to intrude. I just came here to look for a master builder. Then you found him. I'm Master Frost, the master builder of the mountains. That's when I saw how Master Frost had gotten the jump on me. He'd immediately built a staircase behind me and used it to attack me from above. He really was a master builder. Want to come back to my base, Master Frost? I'd love to learn from you. I can even make you your own room. Sure, why not? It's been a while since I've taught a young whippersnapper in the tricks. While we made our way back to my base, we came across a rainbow tree. Wow. Frost built some stairs so I could reach the top, and I mined some unique material with my multi-tool. Super colorful rainbow grass blocks. I returned to my base afterwards and built a new room for Master Frost, even giving him a window made from rainbow glass blocks. It was almost done when Bruce approached me in a panic. Zozo, Lord Business has sent some minions to attack the village. We need your help immediately. On days 32 to 35, I rushed into the village with Bruce, ready to defend it from whatever attack Lord Business had unleashed on us. But I wasn't expecting to see a gang of ender creepers crawling all over the village. The whole village was completely overrun by creepers. They were chasing innocent villagers all around the village. Oh no, looks like Lord Business really took his evil up a notch. Knowing it was dangerous to take on the ender creepers up close, Bruce and I pulled out our bows and started shooting the ender creepers, trying to take them out before they exploded. We had to be extra careful, but with the help of Bruce, we managed to get a lot of them. A few unfortunately slipped through the net with awful consequences. Bruce suddenly looked towards Osiris's secret base. Zozo, look! They're cornering Osiris! Bruce was right! Osiris was being cornered by an ender creeper, slowly creeping towards him. We heard him beg for mercy. No! No, please don't do this! Before we could get close enough to save the resistance beloved leader, we heard it! A Lego boom! The ender creeper exploded, setting off a chain reaction that blew up a bunch of the other houses. The whole village was in ruins! Uh -oh. We rushed to check out Osiris' secret base, but all we saw was smoke rolling out. He was gone! Osiris, no! There was so much left unsaid between us! Come on, Zozo, we can mourn later. We need to stop these heavy creepers before they can do any more damage. 
It didn't take us long to defeat the rest of the Ender Creepers, but with those Cyrus gone, our morale had taken a serious hit. On days 36 to 39, I decided I needed to search further if I wanted to find the third and fourth master builder. That's why I traveled all the way to the Ice Spikes, a scary and desolate land even further away than the snowy tundra. Master builder! Is there a master builder anywhere? I soon came across a Viking villager named Olaf. He was camping in one of the Ice Spikes, eating a Lego apple. He looked exhausted. You okay there, buddy? Oh yes, just taking a breather. You wouldn't happen to be a master builder, would you? No, afraid not. I'm just a viking. But I can tell you where to find a master builder if you help me deal with a little problem I'm having. That sounds awesome. What do you need? There's a bad snowman around here I've been trying to destroy. But I'm having an off day. If you can take care of him for me, I'll give you the information you need. Deal. I wandered around the ice spikes until I found the bad snowman that Olaf had warned me about. Thankfully, I still had plenty of energy, so I pulled out my multi-tool sword and took him by surprise! Don't mess with this, Lego man! That's no joke! He even left a few carrots and snowballs in his chest. Maybe the Viking will want to play a snowball fight with me. I returned to the Viking and told him the good news. The bad snowman had been defeated! Finally! I thought I'd never get to leave this stinking place! Yeah, the snowman even left a few snowballs behind. Wanna play a snowball fight? Uh, no thanks. I'm too old and tired for such games. Oh, okay. So how about the Master Builder? Where can I find the next one? I heard there's one of them hiding out in the swamp, but he likes his privacy. No offense, but you should probably get better before you go see him. If you're not experienced enough, he'll think you're just wasting his time. On days 40 through 43, I returned to the base. Walking through the rubble the creepers left behind reminded me of the loss of our great Osiris leader. This is no time for sadness. I'm ready to practice and improve my building skills, so one day I can have my vengeance. I added some new furniture to the base, along with some bookcases that helped me study the craft of master building. Master Ren approached me midway through my renovations with a new request. Zozo, my student, Lord Business's latest creeper attack on the village has destroyed many homes and left many Lego villagers homeless. You should do them a kindness and make room in your base for them to live in the meantime. Master Ren made a good point. I invited in the homeless Lego villagers and started building another level to my base, complete with beds for them all to sleep in. Just as I finished, Master Frost came to me with an urgent message. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Zozo, but I've received some vital information. Some of my allies have followed up on the lead for one of Lord Business's factories. I need you to investigate and find out what's going on. It's also the perfect time for you to test out my attack from above technique. Of course, Master Frost, I won't let you down! On days 44 to 49, I followed Master Frost's instructions until I reached the factory. It was a spooky looking building, so harsh and out of place in this fun Lego world. I need to stop this madness as soon as possible before it ruins the whole world. I crept inside, trying to stay hidden. But while I may have gotten really good at building, I was kind of terrible at creeping because Lord Business noticed me immediately. Uh -oh. This is private property, Zozo. Did none of your masters ever teach you not to trespass? It's rude. It's also rude to be an evil overlord. What's your end game, Lord Business? What's the big plan here? Well, since you'll never leave this place alive, I guess I can tell you. You see this factory? I'm going to cover the whole world in thousands like it and fill it with builders like you. You'll all either work for me or be destroyed, endlessly building products that I can sell for a massive profit. All for me! You'll never get away with this! I won't let you! You don't have a choice. Remember the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. Speaking of which, meet a friend of mine, the Gold Warrior. A Gold Warrior stepped out from the darkness, ready to fight. Get rid of him. I'm a little too busy to stick around and watch. Lord Business disappeared again, and the Gold Warrior charged at me. On days 50 through 53, I tried to use my skills to fend off the Gold Warrior. He was the strongest enemy I'd ever faced, and he wasn't giving up easy. No matter how fast I tried to run away from him, he caught up to me. Can't we just talk this out, Mr. Gold Warrior? He didn't seem to think so. Instead, he kept trying to jab me with his lethal spiky club. I kept building walls between us, but every time, he'd effortlessly get around them. I was in real trouble. I tried taking him down with a bow, but he used his shield to stop the arrows. 
I got one shot in, but that was about it. This is not effective. I need to change tactics. I pulled out my multi-tool and activated the sword. I couldn't stop him with my master builder techniques or my bow, so I was going to have to fight him directly instead. It was a tough battle, and I lost quite a few hearts along the way. I even got down to half a heart. Luckily, I was able to build my way to safety and eat to regain my health. Phew, this is getting intense. But all right, here goes round two. After a lot of fighting, I was finally able to defeat him. When he went down, he dropped his gold shield and a golden key. Oh, I wonder what this unlocks. I better keep it in my inventory. You never know when you need a key. On days 54 to 57, I left Lord Business's spooky factory and made my way outside onto the plains. But something was already out there waiting for me. A powerful earth elemental, ready to battle. The earth elemental started walking towards me, but out here in the open, I could use my master building skills. I quickly started using the master frost technique, building stairs so I could run up them and attack from above. It's over, I have the high ground. I leaped down onto the earth elemental and destroyed him in one direct strike to the head. He dropped a powerful protection three enchantment book too. This will make me a lot more resistant to damage when I apply it to my armor. Yes. But I should probably wait until I get better armor and apply it then. With my mission complete, I returned to my base to tell Master Frost. I found him sitting on a bench by the lake as he made ice around him freeze up. I told him about Lord Business's evil plan and about my mastery of his technique. Excellent work, Zozo, despite the frightening news. Go see Bruce in a few days. He'll have something valuable for you to do then. Will do. Just make sure that all the fish don't freeze. On days 58 to 62, I decided that my base needed a little tender love and care, so I decided to expand the farm to also include chickens. Mmm, anyone else want a fried egg? But my base was only one half of my defenses. I needed to get myself better armor and tools too. That's why I used my multi-tool to dig into a mine behind my base, going deeper and deeper until I finally found some diamonds. Even though they look like Lego pieces, diamonds are still a master builder's best friend. I took the diamonds back into my crafting room and built myself a full set of diamond gear, weapons, tools, and armor. Then I crafted myself an anvil and applied the Protection 3 book to my diamond chest plate. Now I finally have some proper protection. Wait. What is this? I don't have a full armor bar. I guess Lego diamonds aren't quite as tough as real diamonds. After all that hard work, I built and added a new floor with a lounge and a small terrace to my base so I could finally put my feet up and relax. I just knew it wouldn't last for long. On day 63 to 66, I approached Bruce the Lego villager and asked him what he had for me. I've been closely observing your progress, Zuzu, and I believe you finally have what it takes to meet the next master builder. I've marked out the swamp where he lives on your map. Seek him out and learn his teachings. Thank you, Bruce. Wish me luck. Over the next couple days, I made the long journey to the swamp. It was a dark and humid place with a strong, musty smell. I really didn't want to spend too long here. Even less so when I saw a huge polyfam running towards me, ready to fight. Get out of my swamp, intruder! The polyfam was twice the size of me. I'd never stand a chance against him in a fight. I tried to run away, but he was way ahead of me. The polyfam mined into the ground and rapidly tunneled below me before popping back up out of the ground right in front of me. Please, I don't want any trouble. I'm just looking for the master builder. The polyfam immediately stopped. Oh, why didn't you say so? Nice to meet you. I'm Master Tony, the master builder of the swamp. Master Tony, I'm so pleased to see you. I was told you didn't like visitors. Normally I don't, but today I need a hand. I've got a monstrous swamp leech infestation. If you help me with that, I'll teach you a thing or two. On day 67 to 70, I followed Master Tony deeper into the swamp to help him take on his monstrous swamp leech problem. Being a master builder, I'm pretty strong, but leeches have always squicked me out, so I appreciate your help on this. It didn't take us long to find the leech infestation. I didn't want to get too close either. They looked pretty freaky, so I pulled out my bow and picked them all off at a distance, one arrow at a time. Leeches, be gone! Whoa, I should have been a pest controller. Great job, Zozo. I'm glad I don't need to look at those nasty things anymore. Happy to help. Now, how about that technique? Master Tony was a man of his word. He showed me how he'd mastered the combat tunneling technique. 
how you could use your pickaxe to dig into the ground to escape or create pits for enemies to fall into. Wow. This is awesome! I only need to learn from one more master and I'll be a master builder myself! On day 71 through 74, while searching the plains, I found an entrance leading to some kind of bunker. What could have been inside? And if you like crazy mysteries and wild adventures, you should search for more Zozo videos by typing Z-O-Z-O -Z -O into your search bar. I prepared my diamond sword and climbed down through the door. It looked like some kind of secret bunker underneath, filled with bookshelves and books all marked factory plans. Wait, this place must be owned by Lord Business. Clever observation, Zozo. Lord Business suddenly came out of the secret bookshelf entrance and swung at me with his netherite sword. I barely dodged in time. I made a mistake sending my minions to destroy you before. I should just get it over with and destroy you myself. I tried to fight back, swinging my sword at him. But every time, he blocked my strike and fought back, knocking off a few of my hearts. You're no master builder, Zozo. You're weak, weak, and pathetic. As Lord Business tried to finish me off, all I could do was escape. In a frantic panic, I built a wall between him and myself and made my way out of the bunker while he broke through it. I wasn't strong enough to beat him. All I could do was run, but at least I escaped. This time, anyway. On day 75 through 78, I continued making improvements on my base. It was one of the tallest and most impressive bases I've ever made, so I decided to build downwards too. That's why I made a cozy basement to hold extra supplies. I even installed a few beds just in case. Just as I was finishing up, Master Frost approached me with a gift. Zozo, I just wanted to tell you I'm so proud of all the work you're doing. Nobody is fighting back against Lord Business as hard as you. I wanted to give you a gift as a token of my thanks. It's a potion of strength I brewed for you. Wow, thanks, Master Frost. I can't wait to try it. I drank the potion and felt myself getting bigger and stronger by the second. By the time the transformation was done, I was a full-grown Lego man with 12 hearts. Let's see Lord Business try to take me on now. On day 79 through 84, I decided to travel for a bit to flex my new strength and master builder abilities by taking on some bad guys in the forest. Lucky for me, a gang of bad guys weren't hard to find, as when things got dark, the woods soon became filled with angry skeletons. You guys have got to go down, no bones about it. They didn't appreciate my bad pun. Instead, they attacked me. I decided to put all my master builder skills to use in stopping them. First, I used Master Frost's technique. I quickly made a stairway and climbed to the top to get away from them. Can't get me up here. Then, I used Master Tony's special technique. I leaped down onto the ground from above and started digging until I formed a big square hole in the ground. It didn't take long for the skeletons to follow me and fall in as I climbed back out. Then I capped it off with Master Ren's technique and built a roof over the pit where all the skeletons were trapped, sealing them away forever. Wow, I'm almost a master builder. It's true, and I like your style, Zozo. I turned and saw that an Egyptian jackal had been standing there and watching me the whole time. He seemed impressed. I'm Master Joey, the final master builder. I hear you've been looking for me. You heard correctly, Master Joey. Can you teach me your special technique so I can finally become a true master builder? I won't give you a technique, Zozo, but I will give you a tool. The hammer. When you need it to destroy blocks in a hurry, you just can't beat it. Congratulations, you're a master builder now. On days 85 through 89, I came back to my base with new tools and new knowledge, only to find that we were under attack from a horde of spider creepers. They were crawling all across the village and exploding, destroying chunks of the buildings. I was terrified they would go for my base and the people inside. I can't let you do this. One of the spiders came crawling towards me. Fortunately, Bruce came out of one of the buildings with his bow, helping me fight back. Don't worry, Zozo. You won't need to fight alone. I've got your back. So we fought together, taking on and taking out most of the spider creepers until the rest ran out into the savannah. I've got to go get them. I can't let them get away this time. But as I tried to chase the fleeing group, I saw a baby Lego villager being chased by a spider creeper. I needed to save him. Don't worry, baby, I'll save you. I pulled out my diamond sword, charged in, and defeated the spider creeper. Thank you, Zozo, you saved my life. 
On days 90 to 94, after saving the Lego villager baby, I ran into the forest to chase the fleeing gang of spider creepers. You creeps are gonna pay for what you did to the village. I chased them until I saw that they were trying to hide in a nearby cave, but it was too late. I already saw them. I ran in, ready to fight with my diamond sword, until I noticed that I'd been lured into a trap. There was an ender creeper waiting for me, and he was wearing a name tag. It read, Vice President to Lord Business. Uh-oh, I guess you're not gonna be easy to fight then, are you? The ender creeper, VP, didn't even reply. He just came running at me, and I began to panic. Better use my master builder skills. I couldn't make a staircase in the cave, but I could still use Master Ren's technique and make a wall. I quickly built one up between us, but VP teleported right through it and hit me, knocking off a few hearts. Looks like this is gonna be my hardest battle yet. On days 95 through 97, the battle raged on. VP truly was the toughest enemy I'd ever fought, and often when I tried to hit him, he teleported out of the way. Why won't you stay still and fight fair, VP? You're the VP of being a lousy cheater. Being an ender creeper, he also had the ability to teleport lit TNT right on top of my head. Oh man, I've gotta be careful and dodge his falling TNT. That's when I figured out the perfect method of stopping him. I used Master Tony's technique and created a hole, tricking the Ender Creeper into falling into it. After that, all it took was one strike from above to destroy the Ender Creeper. He even dropped a banana wabba brick, one of the strongest unbreakable pickaxes in the world. So of course, I grabbed it. In that moment, I had a vision revealing the truth about Lord Business. Once, he also wanted to be a master builder, and he sought out the secrets to learn the knowledge and the techniques. But in the end, he was never meant to be. He was too greedy and impatient to truly learn. So instead, he decided he'd make others do the work for him and just take all the money. If Lord Business never even fully gained his master builder skills, maybe I really will be able to finally defeat him. On day 98, I prepared for the final battle, mining to gather extra blocks that I could use in the fight. Before I could leave, each of my friends came to offer words of encouragement. First, Bruce, the Lego villager. You're one of the strongest fighters the resistance has ever had, Zozo. I just want you to know, no matter how this ends, it's been an honor serving with you. Then came Master Ren. You have learned the ways of the master builder, Zozo. Remember them and use them wisely and even Lord Business won't be able to defeat you. And finally, Master Frost. Be creative, Zozo. That's the most important thing, and it's something you're brilliant at. Lord Business will never be able to take that away from you. Hearing all of this made me finally feel ready to take on the evil mastermind behind it all. On day 99, I made my way to Lord Business's business base, where I was sure to find him. On the way there, I saw a Lego kid playing in the savanna. I believe in you, Zozo! You're my hero! Thanks, kid. I'm gonna try my best. But when I arrived outside the business base, I noticed that it was heavily guarded by a gang of soul vultures. Oh no, how can I fight all of these, then take on Lord Business? I'll be outmatched. That's when Master Tony the Polypham suddenly appeared. Don't you worry, buddy. I'll take care of the soul vultures. You get in there and take that businessman down. Thank you, Master Tony. I couldn't do this without you. Master Tony ran in and started fighting the soul vultures. And while he was distracted, I ran right past him and used the key dropped by the gold warrior to enter the business base. I knew that key would come in handy. On day 100, with my tools gathered and my master builder status secured, I entered the inner sanctum of Lord Business's business base. The place was huge, with tall walls and a massive fountain in the middle. I proceeded forward through a treasure room filled with gold piles. He was waiting for me on the other side of the room, sitting in his giant golden throne, laughing evilly. So you're finally here, Zozo, but I'm afraid you're already too late. It's never too late. Ha! That's what you think. My forces are ready to roll out and they follow only my command. This whole world will be turned into one giant corporation, and I will be the CEO. Only a master builder could stop me now. That's the thing, Lord Business. I am a master builder. I pulled out my hammer and prepared to battle the evil businessman for the sake of the world. He jumped off his chair, wielding a netherite sword, and tried to attack me. I quickly built a wall between us, and any time he knocked the wall down, I built another. Aren't you even going to fight back, Zozo? This is pathetic. 
I am fighting. I'm fighting like a master builder. I blocked myself into the treasure room while Lord Business was breaking down my wall. I quickly started building a staircase. As he broke through, I leapt down onto him and hit him. No, no fair. You'd know these techniques if you ever bothered to learn them, Lord Business. And you'd know this technique if you had money. Ender Creepers, attack. Lord Business pulled a dirty trick. Doors around the room opened and heavy creepers started piling in. He was going to blow me sky high. Oh, no. Face it, Zozo, you're outnumbered and outgunned. I've won. Not yet, you haven't. It was time to put all my training to good use for one last move. While the heavy creepers chased me, I mined a huge hole into the ground with my hammer. I pushed Lord Business into the hole. I looked at the creepers and they followed me as I jumped into the hole. Zozo, what are you doing? Finishing this. As Lord Business and the heavy creepers scrambled around, trying to grab me, I placed down the ladders and climbed out of the hole. Yes. Zozo, you fool, let me out of this pit. The heavy creepers will explode. It'll destroy us both. Not quite, Lord Business. Boom, they all exploded, destroying Lord Business with them as I ran from the room. It was finally over. I'd become a master builder and saved the whole world. On day one, I spawned in as a baby robot. Whoa, I'm a tiny robot. But where am I? Why am I in a cage? I looked around and saw there were a couple other bigger robots nearby. They must be my parents. I decided I would go ask them what we were doing here. But before I had a chance to ask them, the door to the cage opened and a giant rat walked into the cage. All right, you junk, it's time to get to work. We're tired of taking orders from you. We can't stand by and watch this factory pollute the world any longer. You think you can rise up against us? Sounds like I need to teach you a lesson, pal. The rat lunged forward and started fighting my robot dad. As they were fighting, my robot mom came up next to me. Zozo, the door is open. Move quickly and get out of here. We will hold him off. But I don't understand. Why are we working for this guy? What are we doing here? There's no time to explain, but he isn't even the one in charge of everything. I hope you never run into his boss. No hurry, get out of here. My mom hurried away to help fight off the rat and I took the chance to rush out the door and escape. As I drove away, I turned around and saw the rat destroy my dad. Dad, no! I thought about going back, but I noticed I only had six hearts. If I was captured or killed, my dad's sacrifice would be in vain. As I drove away, I noticed that I had just escaped from a huge factory. There were big pillars of smoke coming out of it, which must have been causing all of the yellow haze. I better get out of here before that rat shows up, or worse, his boss. I was driving away when suddenly I started beeping and my battery started to drain. Oh no, my battery is going to run out in 30 seconds. What's going on? In a panic, I backed up into the sunlight and saw that my battery immediately started to recharge and returned to full. Whew, that was scary. I must be a solar powered robot. I'll have to be sure to stay in the light when I'm out and about. I soon found a good place to build a shelter for the night and quickly put up some walls. I made sure to leave the roof open so I could power back up in the morning. On day two, I woke up to a full battery and sunlight coming into my shelter. Looks like my shelter kept me safe through the night, but I have a lot I need to figure out today, starting with rescuing my mom, if she's alive. I knew I wouldn't be able to get back into the factory without gearing up first, which is when I noticed that my arm was a permanent drill. I'll bet I can break all kinds of locks with this arm. I'm going to try and go get some supplies. I stepped outside my base when I was suddenly attacked by some kind of tiny animal. Ah, what the heck are you? Get back. I swung my drill arm and quickly defeated the enemy. That looked like some kind of mutated bunny. I wonder where he came from. I'll have to keep an eye out. I headed over to a nearby hill where there were some trees growing and collected some wood and stone. Then I set up a crafting table and made an ax, shovel, and sword. My drill arm was pretty handy though. So I decided to start building a mine inside my base. I drilled into the ground and saw I was able to break a bunch of blocks at once. Whoa, mining is going to be a breeze. I was digging down and my battery alarm went off again. I was so excited about my drill, I almost forgot I had to stay in the sun. Luckily, I was able to get out before the timer ran out too quickly. Looks like I'm gonna have to be a lot more strategic every time I wanna leave the sun. On day three, I decided to venture out a little further to see if I could find some more supplies. I knew I still wasn't strong enough to break my mom out. As I got closer to a nearby cave, I saw something strange inside. What is that? It looks like there's a deactivated robot in there. Their battery must have run out. As I got closer to investigate, I was attacked by a mutant pig. Whoa, get back. The mutant pig had come out of nowhere, but I was able to quickly fight them off. As they disappeared, I saw a whole horde of pigs coming over the hill. I better get out of here. As I was driving away, I couldn't help but wonder what was happening to all of the animals and who was in that cave. Maybe they would be able to help me in the fight. I'd have to try and come check on them later. On days four and five, I was running away when I stumbled across a small farming village, but noticed none of their crops really seemed to be growing. I decided to try and get more information, so I headed to the house at the top of the hill. Hello, is anyone home? The door opened and a farmer stepped out. Hey there, I'm trying to find out what's going on around here. What's wrong with your crops? 
She explained that the smog coming from the factory was killing all of her crops. Not only that, the smog was also turning all the animals into mutated versions of themselves. She explained that the only way would be to take out the factory's boss, Fat Cat. But everyone was too scared to get close to the factory, so she didn't know any good ways to do that. Well, I've been there once. I can try and get close and see what I can find out. Thanks for your help. I drove off in the direction of the factory. Hopefully I could learn something new before trying to break in. On day six to eight, I started making my way back towards the factory. As I reached the top of the hill, I ran into a mutated sheep. Ah, another one. Take this, you creepy sheepy. By using my sword, I was able to take it down. That farmer was right. The smog is making all the animals crazy. I kept going on my way when I ran into a zombie. As I started to attack him, I noticed he had something interesting in his hand. Are those robot tracks? I'm sure you won't mind me taking those off your hands. After a few hits, he was down. And I was right. He dropped a new set of tracks. I picked them up. Oh, nice. These Mark 1 tracks will give me an armor upgrade. Oh, and check it out. They gave me a speed boost, too. Now I'll be able to get farther on my limited battery. On days 9 to 10, I rolled up to the gates of the factory and took a look inside. Hmm, I don't see much on this side. The workers must be inside. I'll go see if there's anything on the other side. As I got closer to the other side, I could see someone in a suit yelling at a robot. That suit, it must be Fat Cat. I looked into the yard and saw who he was shouting at. It was my mom. We know you helped that little robot escape. You're gonna work overtime until we find him. My mom didn't say anything. She was so brave. If I was going to help her though, I was going to need to find a way to get in. Just then, I heard some pistons moving and snuck over to where I heard the noise. As I peeked over the edge, I saw an opening in the wall of one of the guard towers, and a couple of rats were talking outside. What do you think of my secret door? Pretty nifty, huh? Now we can sneak out and skip work. Nobody will know. I still wasn't strong enough to fight, but knowing this will help me sneak in in the future. As I turned to leave though, my new track squeaked, getting the attention of the rats. Hey, what was that? The rats rushed over to where I was hiding, but thanks to my new speed, I was able to get away without them seeing me. Don't worry mom, I'll come back for you. On days 11 through 14, I was heading back to my base when I realized the sun was starting to set. I started putting together a small hut to protect me for the night when I was suddenly attacked by a giant mutated zombie. Holy cow, this guy is huge! I started to build even faster but couldn't focus as I had to keep running away from the zombie. If he keeps chasing me, I'm not going to be able to finish my house before the sun goes down. The sun kept going down and my battery soon started to beep, starting the 30 second countdown. Oh no, if I could just finish. As much as I tried, I couldn't finish the house. All I could do was jump into the unfinished finished build and hope for the best. My battery let out a final beep and I deactivated. On day 15 I awoke to an unfamiliar face looking at me. Huh? Good morning little friend. How are you feeling? Wh what happened? Who are you? Don't be alarmed. My name is Gary and I'm here to help. I managed to grab you before that zombie could rip you to pieces. Thank you. You saved me. Whoa, and what's this? Did you upgrade my battery? I did. I wish I could do more but I only had parts on hand to give you a 60 second charge when you're out of the sun. Wow, that's great. How did you know how to do that? The old man sighed before heading into his story. My wife and I actually used to work at the factory building robots just like you. It was a clean, safe place for everyone, and the factory didn't produce the pollution that you see today. But then one day Fat Cat showed up and turned it into the mess you see now. He mistreats the robots and makes them work non-stop, which causes the factory to pollute the land. My wife and I had to flee for our safety. We planned to save the land from the factory, but my wife got sick and wanted to spend her last days growing her flower garden, but nothing would stay alive. She passed away soon after. I can't take Fat Cat down by myself, and everyone else is too afraid to help. But if you are willing to work with me, I think we can do it. I'm so sorry to hear about everything you've gone through. Fat Cat has taken enough from us. Let's take this guy down. On day 16 to 19, I left Gary's house and went to find a good place to build myself a base of operations. After a little bit of searching, I found a good spot to start building. I first cleared out the land, then got to work laying the foundation of the house. Then I put up walls to keep the mutants out, and finally, put up the base itself, making sure to leave windows in the ceiling for light to get in. Once that was finished, I filled the interior with everything I would need. Home sweet home. I hope this can be a place of safety for anyone who wants to help in our fight. That reminded me, what happened to that robot I saw in the caves? If I could just get a little stronger, I could fight my way past those mobs and see what was going on. On days 20 to 22, I woke up to sheep sounds outside my base. Oh nice, I could use their wool to build some things. I hurried to my base door and saw a bunch of mutant sheep outside. Oh right, I forgot everything here was green. Oh well, good to know my walls kept them out. I opened the door and started to fight them. I noticed a little mutant bunny was also joining in on the fight. How'd you get mixed up with these bad people? I finished them all off, no problem. After the fight, I could feel a power surge and I suddenly grew into a bigger robot. All right, I even gained four more hearts. I looked closer at my drill. It now had a diamond tip. Wow. I decided to go and give it a test. Looks like I 
can break blocks even faster than before. This is great. On days 23 to 27, I left my base to try and look for that robot in the cave. I had no idea if they would still be there, but maybe they could help in our fight against Fat Cat. Since I had just gotten my new upgrades, it felt like the right time to try again. Before I got back to the cave, I stopped by an abandoned mine shaft I had seen earlier. I'm going to need a way to transport the robot back so I can take these old rails to do it. I soon gathered up all the rails and found myself looking over the cliff to the cave. It looked like the robot was still in there, so I rushed down the hill and attacked the mutant pigs. I'm not gonna run away this time. They put up a good fight, but my new abilities were too much for them. I fought as hard as I could and won. Finally, now I can get this robot out of here. Looks like they're deactivated. I quickly laid down some tracks, got the robot into a minecart, and started heading back to the base. On days 28 to 32, I arrived back at the base, and I saw Gary had moved a lot of his supplies in. This will help us coordinate our plans much easier. Gary, I found this robot out in a cave. Do you think you can help her? Oh, I recognize this model. They call her Eve. Gary took a look and could immediately tell what was wrong. Yep, looks like her battery's fried. She must have been caught out in the wilderness. So what can we do? Do you think you can fix her? Not with the supplies I have on hand, but I know of a warehouse in the desert that used to have the components. I can tell you where to go to find it. Gary told me where to go, but before I left, I made some improvements to the base. I added a second layer to the walls and got to work on building Gary a house to work out of. Everything was looking great, and I even built a working drawbridge. No one is going to be breaking into here. On days 33 to 36, I was getting ready to leave when Gary stopped me and said he had something to ask me. Zozo, I had a question to ask you. Why are you so nice to everyone? Well, I wish I could take all the credit, but there's a robot I really really look up to has inspired me to be nice and always try and help. He's a sassy dude, but in the end, he always does the right thing. That's great. I think we should build a statue of this robot as a symbol to everyone, but they are still good in this world. That would be a great idea. I rushed out and was able to find some non-mutated sheep to use for the build. I led them back to the base and put them in a pen I had made. Then I got to work on the statue. I started with the base, then moved on to the statue itself. After a while, I had finished the first part. This is coming along great. I hope you're enjoying it so far too. If you like what you're seeing, be sure to subscribe to the channel. That way, you'll you'll never miss my next adventure. On days 37 to 40, I entered the desert to begin my journey to the warehouse. I can already feel the temperature rising, but that means lots of sunlight for my battery. As I made my way toward a small hill, I heard a strange sound up ahead. I wonder what that could be. As I came over the hill, I saw a group of mutant horses who attacked me. Ah, oh, this feels so wrong to be fighting horses. But you guys aren't as nice as your non-mutant brothers. After a tough fight, I was able to finish them off. I made it through, but these mobs were getting tougher. I'm gonna have to find a good spot to build a camp and craft some upgrades. Who knows what could be waiting for me at the warehouse. On days 41 to 43, I found a nice spot against the cliff full of ores. Whoa, look at all these ores. I can use these to give myself an upgrade. I also noticed there was a nice spot in the corner where I could build a camp. I quickly laid down some blocks for a foundation and then set up all the tools I would need. Then I worked on building the walls and finished it up with a glass ceiling. With the base set up, I headed over to the ore deposit and mined out some gold and some iron. I can use this iron to upgrade my armor, and I've got a special item in mind for the gold. I quickly smelted down all the iron in my blast furnace, then got started smelting all the gold. Then I made an iron chest plate, iron leggings, and an iron helmet. With the leftover iron, I decided to make myself an iron sword, axe, shovel, and hoe as well. To finish up, I then made a gold block, which I then mixed with some gold bars in my tire tracks. This let me upgrade my tracks to the Mark II version which gave me even more protection than before. Wow. I feel like I can take on anything now. Let's go find that warehouse. From days 44 to 49, I left my house to finally find the warehouse. After a while, I could finally see it. That must be it. I hope the parts we need are inside. As I entered the building, I could see the place was in ruins. This place has been completely picked apart. It looks like I might just have to head home and figure something else out. Hey you! A little rat came running over to me. What could he want? What do you want? Aren't you working with Fat Cat? No, no, not at all. You think rats want to work with cats? That giant rat has betrayed all rat kind, and I want to take him out. You think you can help? It sounds like we want the same thing, but how do I know I can trust you? You came here to this warehouse because you're looking for something, right? The giant rat cleaned all these warehouses out and moved everything to his base. I can show you where it is. I didn't know if I could trust him, but I agreed to work with him, so we headed off to the base. On days 50 to 53, the rat and I were traveling when a gazelle called out to us from a village. It looked like something was wrong. Hey, what's going on? She told us that a group of husks were attacking their village and they needed our help. If we would help them, she would give me something useful. I'm always happy to do what I can. She led us into the village and I charged at the husks. The rat even joined in on the fight. Maybe I could trust him after all. It wasn't long until we had eliminated all of the husks and stay down. The gazelle thanked us for our help and told us to follow her to the village workshop. When we arrived, she told me to take what was inside the chest. Whoa, are these blueprints on how to build a focus lens? If I can build that, then I could use it to redirect light into deep holes for mining. On days 54 to 
157, I decided I would construct a lens and try to mine for diamonds. I first needed to gather some resources though, so I headed out into the desert. While I was on my way, I was suddenly attacked by a gang of mutant cats. These mutant animals are just getting weirder and weirder. I noticed there was a little mutant bird fighting along them too. A bird fighting with cats and rats are working with fat cat? This world is crazy. After beating the mutants, I got to work digging up some sand to make glass. Once I had collected all the sand I needed, I headed back to my base and started smelting the sand. Alrighty, time to start building this lens. I constructed two pillars for the base, then put the lens together using the glass I had just smelted. There was a shadow on the ground for now, but once I turned the lens, that should disappear. Okay, let's see if this thing works. I headed over to the activate button and gave it a press. As the lens rotated, I saw the shadow on the ground disappear. I quickly got to work digging a deep hole. It's nice to not have to worry about my battery running out. Once I started to hit bedrock, I built an angled mirror at the bottom so I could do some strip mining. The mirror was able to reflect enough light for me to be able to start mining to the side. Before long, I mined into a room full of diamonds. Amazing, this is just what I needed. I quickly mined all of the ores that I could and then headed out of the mine to craft. On days 58 to 62, I headed into my base to start crafting with the new materials I had just mined. I noticed that while I had been down in the mines, the rat had made himself a small hut off to the side of my base. Pretty cozy. Back at my crafting table, I made a diamond chest plate, helmet, and leggings. With the remaining diamonds, I also made myself a sword. Feels good to know this armor will keep me safer than before. The fight against giant rat will be a tough one. On day 63 to 66, I met the rat outside my base. Before we get going, is there anything else that I need to know? Yeah, you'll need all the support you can get. So anyone who is listening to this should subscribe and like the video. That ought to give you the strength you need. That's true. That would help a ton. The rat and I headed off to go fight the giant rat. We soon left the desert and entered the Badlands. As we made our way, we suddenly saw a pack of mutant wolves headed right at us. Mutant wolves now? This just doesn't even surprise me anymore. The rat and I launched into attack mode and fought against the pack. The rat was proving to be a good teammate and we were able to defeat them in no time. Nice job. I feel like we're making a great team. On day 67 to 70, we made our way to the edge of a cliff overlooking the giant rat's warehouse. Whoa, do you see that? Running into the warehouse was a huge pack of rats, all carrying different pieces of loot. We were definitely in the right place. All right, buddy, what's the best way in? I waited for the rat to reply, but he didn't say anything. Suddenly, I heard a bunch of squeaking and saw the pack of rats come screaming out of the building. They were headed right towards us. He had betrayed us. No, I thought you were my friend. Soon the rats were on me and I tried to fight them off. Oh no, there's so many of them. I don't know if I can get out of this one. I managed to take a few of them out, but it felt like a fight I couldn't win. And I was right. The rats injected me with something that depleted my battery, and I shut oh, down. No. While I was shut down, the rats pushed me down the hill, into the warehouse, and locked me away in a cell. On days 71 to 74, I started the day deactivated in the jail cell, when suddenly there was a huge explosion in the ceiling. The roof blew away, which let light come in, recharging my battery to full. As I turned back on, I saw Gary jump in from the ceiling. Gary, you're here! Come on, Zozo, let's get you out of here. Gary set some TNT by the jail doors and blew a hole in the bars. As we jumped through, we were attacked by the gang of rats. You guys aren't going to shut me down again. With Gary's help, we were able to fight off the horde of rats, but since we were out of the sun, my battery had started to deplete again. Don't worry, Zozo, I've got a solution to your battery problem. Gary took out his bazooka and blasted a hole in the roof, which let the sun come in. I quickly recharged. Let's take a look at these supply closets. I'm sure there's going to be some useful items. Gary and I started looking at all the crates, and there were tons of useful items. Now they're right scraps. I can use this to upgrade my gear. I went ahead and grabbed the emeralds too, just for good measure. We continued moving through the warehouse, with Gary blowing holes in the roof as we went. In the next room, we found even more supplies. More netherite scraps and healing potions. Whoa, and check it out, gold nuggets. Just what I need to make some netherite ingots. We'd gotten some good loot, but we still needed to get parts to fix Eve. There was only one place we hadn't checked, Giant Rat's office. On days 75 to 78, we reached the Giant Rat's office. Watch out, Rat Man, we're coming in. I punched the door open and headed inside with Gary. Giant Rat was inside on his desk. His battery was on the wall behind him. Give us the battery or we're going to have to take you out too. This battery powers the one robot with the code to shut down Fat Cat's factory. You found it, didn't you? I know where your little base is. Once I've taken care of you, I'll destroy that little robot once and for all. We'll never let you destroy her. We're taking that battery and shutting the factory down. Just then, the giant rat leaped forward and started attacking Gary. We both pulled out our weapons and started to fight. Stay strong, Gary. We can beat this guy. The giant rat was really powerful, and my health bar got really low. But in the end, we were finally able to defeat him. We did it. Nice job, Gary. Let's grab the battery and get out of here. Gary? I turned and saw that Gary had been seriously wounded. Gary, you don't look so good. Come on, let's get you some help. There's no time, Zozo, but there's something you should know first. I was the one that hid the robot Eve away. She needed to be in a safe place. I thought telling you what code she contained would put you in too much danger. The more he spoke, the worse he looked. It's okay, it's okay. Maybe you should sit down. Gary slumped down against the wall. 
You've been a great friend, Zozo. I know you can do this. She would have loved you too. She? I had hoped to see your flowers bloom one more time. My wife. Her name was Eve. Gary put his head down and he was gone. Thank you for everything, Gary. I won't let you down. On day 79 to 84, I grabbed the battery off the wall and left the office. I couldn't believe Gary was gone. As I headed down the stairs, I heard a familiar voice. So, now that the giant rat is gone, you need a new leader. And that leader should be me. This whole time that rat was just trying to take over the rats. I couldn't let this stand. You cost me everything. I charged down the stairs and attacked the rat. I was so angry I was able to defeat him in no time. All the other rats were so scared they didn't even try to get involved. I've got to get this battery back to Eve and shut down the factory. I headed out to return to the base. On days 85 to 89, I arrived back at the base and put Eve's battery pack in. After a moment, she booted up and looked right at me. Hello, what's your name? Hi, I'm Zozo. Gary told me that you should have code to shut down the Fat Cat factory. Is that true? That is correct. I would be happy to assist you with doing so. Where is Gary? I would love to see my creator again. He didn't make it, but he would have wanted us to work together. I see. I'm sorry to hear it, but I agree. Gary and Eve are my best friends, and I'm sure we will be good friends too. I agree, which reminds me, do you think he could help me with something? Eve and I headed outside, and I got her help finishing the robot statue. Finishing the statue gave me the courage to be brave. Brave like my robot hero, and brave like Gary. Before long, the statue was complete. This looks amazing. Thanks for all of your help, Eve. From there, I went to work on building Eve a place to stay as well. I made sure to give her everything she needed to be comfortable. Once I finished the outside, I worked on decorating the inside with all the tools she'll need. With everything complete, I just had one more task to finish. Using the nether scraps and gold I had collected, I made a netherite ingot. Then, I used that to upgrade my diamond sword. Nothing's gonna stop us now. On days 90 to 94, I decided I should go through Gary's room to see if there was anything he may have had to help us in the final fight. As I was looking around, I came across Gary's diary. His last entry confirmed his plan to follow me to the warehouse. Under that entry was a note meant for me. If you're reading this, I didn't make it. The last thing I need to tell you is that Eve knows how to do something special. She can also craft a battery for you. With such a battery, you can function without the need for sunlight. Wow, what an amazing gift. I'll go ask her. I headed back out and found Eve. I asked her about the battery. Let me check my data logs. Scanning. Oh yes, I found the recipe. Right this way. Eve grabbed some supplies from a chest, then headed over to the crafting table. Moments later, we headed outside, and she tossed the new battery pack to me. I put it in. I immediately felt a power surge and turned into a giant robot. My battery pack showed it was upgraded too. Whoa, look at me, I feel great. Fat Cat isn't gonna know what hit him. On days 95 to 96, I headed outside to meet up with Eve. Today's the day, Eve, let's go save the world. Eve and I took off in the direction of the factory. After a while, we arrived near the edge. Looking ahead, I could see some rats patrolling the perimeter. Once they had passed, we snuck up to the hidden entrance I had seen before. If we hit this button, it will let us inside. I hit the button and Eve and I snuck inside. Once we were in, we didn't see anyone else around. It looks like the coast is clear. Let's see if we can get to the robots inside. As we ran across the open space, we heard a squeak. A single rat guard was standing there. Maybe he can tell us where the robots are. Hey, don't move and we won't hurt you. Where are all the robots? Fag Cat gathered them all in the incinerator room. He's threatening to melt them all down because one lady robot keeps trying to lead revolts. That sounds like my mom. Thanks for the tip. We can't risk you giving us away though, so I'm sure you won't mind us locking you up. Mm -hmm. Eve shot a rat net at him, which put him in a rat sack. I picked him up and put him in my safety compartment. Come on, let's get to the incinerator room. On days 97 to 98, we entered the incinerator room and saw my mom dangling above the lava pit. We have to save her. Hang on, mom, we'll get you out. I looked across the room and saw a lever that controlled the device, but then I noticed a rat on the other side of the room watching us. He ran towards the lever. Oh no, you don't. I ran toward the rat while Eve started shooting her laser cannon. It was a close one, but we managed to take him out before he could pull the switch. Zozo, is it really you? Mom, I'm so glad to see you're still alive. Where are all the other robots? We have to get everyone out. Fat Cat is keeping them locked in the next room over. I can get them out, but I don't know how we'll get out of here unnoticed. There's a secret entrance that we use to get in. You guys can use that to escape. Thank you, Zozo, and be safe. Fat Cat will be in the main factory. I love you. Good luck. On day 99, we left the incinerator room and made our way towards the main factory. On our way toward the factory doors, we heard a terrifying voice. Well, 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 if it isn't little Zozo. Fat Cat was looking down at us from the factory's second story window. Fat Cat, the madness has to stop. We're shutting down this factory one way or another. We'll see about that. Rat Pack, attack! 
Just then, the largest pack of rats I had ever seen came charging at us. This must have been every rat in the factory. Time to see how good my upgrades really were. Bring it on, you little creeps. Even I threw everything we had at the rats. With my new abilities, these rats didn't stand a chance. Eve shot them with her laser cannon, and I hit them back with my new gear. Before long, we had managed to take most of them out, which made the remaining rats all run away in fear. Yeah, you better run. Eve and I walked up to the factory door, but before going in, I turned to talk to Eve. Eve, I could really use your help in this fight, but we can't risk you getting hurt. We need you to stay safe so you can shut down the factory. I understand. And Zozo, there's something else I want to say before you go in there. Yeah, what is it? I know you'll make it through this, and I just think everyone should subscribe so they can see what you'll do next. Wow, that really means a lot to me, Eve. Thank you. I'll see you when it's all done. On day 100, I entered the factory and saw Fat Cat looking down at me from the second story balcony. It's over, Zozo. I have the high ground. What? This little revolution ends today. I don't care how many rats you kill or how many robots you free. I'll never shut this place down. And just like that, he attacked. As we exchanged blows, it was clear to me that he was way stronger than I could have thought. You could have had a great life working in my factory and making me rich, but it looks like it's over for you. My hearts were getting really low. It didn't look like I was going to make it. But just then, a laser came out of nowhere and hit Fat Cat. Eve! Eve came in and started fighting with Fat Cat, which gave me a second to use my potions and heal up. Then I got back into the fight. You're in trouble now, Fat Cat. As I started to fight, I was able to distract Fat Cat and lead him away. While I did that, Eve snuck around to the main factory shutoff and input her code. No, my factory! Suddenly, Fat Cat stopped moving and a tiny cat popped out. He was a cat in a robot suit this whole time. There he is, boys! Get him! The pack of rats appeared and chased Fat Cat out of the factory. We did it, Eve! I'm sure the world will return back to normal in no time. Now let's go find my mom. We have a lot of catching up to do. I think Gary would have been proud. On day one, I spawned into the alien fields as Pikachu, the world's most iconic Pokemon. Pikachu! Pikachu! Phew, sorry, allergies. At least I'm starting off with 10 hearts. That's pretty cool. I wonder if I have any powers. Suddenly, I activated my lightning attack and zapped a nearby tree. What a cool starting power. I have electricity powers, just like the real Pikachu. This is going to be so much fun. But how come I'm the only Pikachu here? Are there any others? But instead of other Pikachu, I saw a big, scary Enderman wandering towards me. Whoa, a real Pikachu. I thought Broden was just bluffing, but he really did manage to conjure us a Pikachu. How exciting. Broden? What are you talking about? I'm Zozo. I just got here. What? He can talk? Gross. That's weird. Broden isn't going to be happy with a defective Pikachu. I better destroy you. I have no idea what's going on here, but I'm going to get out as quickly as I can. So I did, turning and running away from the Enderman before he or his mysterious buddy Broden could destroy me. Already, this doesn't seem like a nice place for a Pikachu to be. I took a second to rest when a skeleton came shambling towards me. Not today, bony. With a zap of my lightning powers, the skeleton was gone. I found somewhere that seemed relatively calm and decided to lay down to rest. I know I'm not meant to be here, but I need to figure out why before I can escape. On day two, I woke up and decided that I couldn't afford to just sit around and mope about being trapped in this weird world. I need to figure out a solution to my predicament, but first, I need to get myself some tools. With a lot of effort, I broke down a tree until I could make enough planks and sticks to make a crafting table and a wooden pickaxe. From there, I mined into the ground and collected enough stone to craft myself a stone pickaxe and a stone sword. Okay, I can't deny that a little Pikachu holding a big stone sword looks really funny. I don't think I'm going to be able to intimidate anyone like this. Still, with my new tools, I decided to search around until I found an iron golem standing at a campfire, chilling. He saw me, but he didn't try to chase or attack me. That was a good sign. Excuse me, Mr. Iron Golem, could you explain what's going on around here? Sure, but first... Answer this question for me. Am I dreaming right now? Uh, I don't think so. So, I'm actually seeing a talking Pikachu right now. Huh, this has got to be the work of Broden the Conjurer. Broden, that weird Enderman told me about him. What's his deal? He's kind of a weird dude. He's a really powerful Conjurer, but he's super greedy and possessive. He just uses powers to summon stuff for himself. And if he's not happy with it, he or his goons destroy it. Yikes, then I guess I gotta stop him before he has a chance to destroy me. 
Right on, little dude. I noticed I was hungry, and the iron golem gave me some nice apples to save my hunger. It was relieving to know that there were still good people out here. On day three, after leaving the spacey iron golem with his campfire, I went off searching for somewhere to live in the alien fields. I should probably start building my base, but man, that's gonna be so much work, especially for a teeny little Pikachu like me. But that's when I had a stroke of good luck. I found a broken down hut in a clearing. Wait, maybe I can clean this place up rather than making a whole base from scratch. That'll be perfect for me. I started cleaning up the mess and rebuilding the broken parts of the base. It felt like some bizarro Pokemon Home Reno show, but by the time I was done, things were coming along really well. I could see myself staying here. But suddenly, I was interrupted by a vicious killer rabbit running towards me. A creature that weird must have been created by that weird Broden guy, just like me. I zapped the nasty killer rabbit with my lightning powers, then finished it off with my new stone sword. What's down, duck? It's you. You're down, because I defeated you. I really need to work on my wood equips. Defeating the rabbit also gave me enough XP to level up. I evolved into a bigger, stronger Pikachu with 20 hearts. Awesome, I really am a Pikachu, and I'm feeling stronger already. With that victory under my belt, I spent the rest of my day watching my favorite show. What an eventful day. From day four to day five, I ventured back into the depths of the alien fields to collect more materials for expanding my base. Electricity-based attacks may be what I'm known for, but it turns out I'm a master carpenter. Who knew? While collecting more stone and chopping down more wood, I heard a rustling and stopped. I turned and saw the same long, lanky Enderman who'd hassled me when I first spawned. Oh no, not you again! Oh yeah, it's me! Bet you never thought you'd see me again! I just hoped I'd never see you again. Why do you work for this Broden guy anyway? What does he actually want? He wants everything, and he can get it too, cause he's a conjurer! Get it? He conjures stuff, and he also conjures things for his friends, like me. Then why does he want to destroy me? If he can just make himself another Pikachu, can't he just let me go? He's a perfectionist! If Broden can't have exactly what he wants, he'll destroy everything! That's why I need to destroy you now! The time for talk was over! I fired a lightning strike at the Enderman, and he fought back. It was a tense battle, but this time, I wasn't running. I defeated the Enderman and headed back to my base. This Broden guy sounds like no fun at all! From day six to day eight, I entered a cave, feeling confident enough to venture into the depths and get myself some cool new materials. After all, with a cool stone pickaxe, I can finally mine iron ore. This wasn't just some shallow cave though, it kept going and going and going. I had a feeling that I could get lost down here if I wasn't careful. It's so eerie to be alone here. But sadly, I wasn't alone. There was a big, scary wither waiting for me, and it blasted some wither skulls at me. I took a few hits, then returned fire, attacking relentlessly until the wither was no more. I definitely didn't want to run into another one of those. Instead, I went just a little deeper into the cave. There, I found some iron ore and quickly mined a bunch of it. I took it back to my base and smelted it, and created myself a brand new iron sword and iron pickaxe. This plucky Pikachu is armed and dangerous. From day nine to day 10, I decided it was time for a change of scenery. So I traveled out to the Badlands, which were hot and dry compared to the alien fields. Still, what a view. However, I wasn't able to take in the view for long as I was approached by a mysterious figure, an illager from faraway lands. As I approached, I felt a strange energy coming off of him, like he was oddly familiar. Hi there, I'm Zozo. Do I know you from somewhere? I'm getting the weirdest sense of deja vu right now. You've probably heard of me and the great Broden, impresario, part-time psychic, noted indie singer-songwriter, and conjurer extraordinaire. Oh no, you're Broden? Oh yes, I'm Broden, and you belong to me. Time to go, little Pikachu. You can never send an Enderman to do a conjurer's job. I tried to zap him with my lightning, but it didn't seem to affect him. And with one hit from him, I was already on the ropes. All I could do was run off into the Badlands as fast as I could, until I didn't see Broden the Conjurer anywhere behind me. It was the most stressful day yet. I'm gonna need to become a lot stronger before I'm ready to fight this guy. After a day of aimless wandering, I ended up running into another weird creature, an iron chicken, and we seem to have something in common. Broden the Conjurer created me too. He thought the idea of an iron chicken was funny, but then after a week, he got bored of me and tried to destroy me. I was lucky to escape with my life. 
This guy is a monster. Say, want to come back to my base with me? Us weird conjured creatures ought to stick together if we want to survive. And as we get stronger, we can work towards defeating him together. Sounds good to me, Zozo. Let's go. From day 11 to day 12, I returned to my base with the Iron Chicken. He needed somewhere to stay, so I took the time to build him a new room. Thankfully, with him being a little Iron Chicken, it didn't need to be a very big room. When I was finished, he was eager to get some shut-eye in there. Thanks, Zozo. This is so much nicer than just wandering around the Badlands. But while the Iron Chicken slept, I realized I still had a major headache from where Brod and the Conjurer hit me. I'm too small for regular armor, but I should probably at least create a helmet to protect my head. I ventured back into the same mining cave from before and descended in. It was just as dark and scary as before, but thankfully this time, there was no wither to bother me. I mined some iron ore to take back to my base and smelt, but on the way back, I was attacked by an angry Pigaris. None of my attacks were powerful enough to hurt him, so I was forced to retreat further back into the cave. I needed a way to defeat him, but I was scared of getting too close and being defeated myself. That's when I found just what I needed laying around in the cave. A bow and some arrows? Perfect! I went back and used the bow to defeat the Pigaris at a safe distance before running back out of the cave with my hard-earned iron ore. I returned to my base and smelted the iron and used it to craft an iron helmet. This should come in handy the next time I take a knock to the noggin. From day 13 to day 15, I spoke more to the Iron Chicken about his experiences with Broden the Conjurer. Knowledge is power, and the more I knew about him, the more chance I'd have of finding a weakness. So, Iron Chicken, what was it like when he spawned you? Well, just like you, I spawned in out of nowhere, and Broden was waiting for me. At first, he seemed so nice and kind and happy to see me. He was a little kooky, but honestly, I liked him. A little by little, over time, I could tell something was off. And one day, he attacked me and tried to destroy me, just because he was bored of me. He's incredibly powerful, so if I hadn't moved quickly like I did, I would have been doomed. He's kind when he wants you, and unimaginably cruel when he doesn't. I can only imagine some of the scary things he's conjured over the years. After hearing the Iron Chicken story, I felt a chill go down my Pokemon's spine. If he was really that powerful, how could I have any real chance of defeating him? Especially at my current strength level. I'm kind of beginning to wish I hadn't asked now. From day 16 to day 19, I woke up to some shocking news. The Iron Chicken had gone missing. Oh no, I need to find and save him. I wonder where he could be. Strangely, there was a terrible smell lingering. Maybe the Iron Chicken had been kidnapped by some kind of really stinky assailant? I followed the smell as it got stronger and stronger. A day later, I arrived in the bamboo jungle where the smell was particularly strong. I'm so lucky that this mysterious kidnapper never showers. From there, it didn't take me very long to hunt down the stinky kidnapper. It was a huge, scary vile ogre. You're the one who kidnapped my friend. How dare you? Oh, get over it. Kidnapping your foolish metal chicken friend is the best way to get leverage with Broden the Conjurer. If I return his chicken to him, maybe he'll give me whatever I want. I'm never gonna let that happen. I fought hard against the stinky vile ogre, using my powers and my iron sword to defeat him. Soon enough, only I remained. This gave me enough XP to level up and evolve again. Getting bigger, tougher, going up to 30 hearts. Every day, I'd get a little bigger and tougher. Then, the iron chicken ran out from behind the bamboo. Zozo, that was amazing. I was watching you from behind the bamboo. Thanks for saving me from that stinky weirdo. No problem, I see. Head back to the base. We'll talk again later. I'm gonna keep exploring the bamboo jungle. The iron chicken left, and I continued looking around. It was a nice, calming place. Bamboo is one of the fastest growing plants. That's something to aspire to. Over the course of the journey, I ran into a pair of aggressive skeletons. Without any hesitation, I used my lightning to take out the two bony fiends. And shortly after those two were gone, a genie floated out towards me. Good work defeating those skeletons, Zozo. They were really spoiling the view. Wait, how do you know my name? I know many things. I also know of your quest to defeat Broden the Conjurer. I may have some information that will help you along the way if you'll hear me out, little Pokemon. Of course, please, tell me more. A special food item. One that will give you the power you need to surpass the Conjurer. The Dynamax Candy. Dynamax Candy? But where can I find it? I'm afraid I've said too much already. 
Good luck, Zozo. May we meet again someday. And with that, the genie left, and I was left alone again. I need to find that Dynamax candy somehow. From day 20 to day 22, I returned to my base to find some skeletons waiting for me. They must have been angry at me for taking out their skeleton buddies back in the bamboo jungles. The skeletons attacked, but now I was strong enough to pretty easily defeat them all. I returned to my room to relax. Iron Chicken came in to talk to me. You wanted to see me, Zozo? Yeah, I've had an idea for a statue, something we can build to help inspire us. I know just the thing. Iron Chicken was so eager to get started that he went off to begin while I was still resting. By the time I left my room to take a look, he'd already made some amazing progress. This looks incredible, Iron Chicken. Thank you, Zozo. I just thought you had such a great idea. I felt completely inspired. Take a load off now. I'll add a little myself. After the Iron Chicken left to rest, I added a little extra to the statue before calling it a day. Still, Iron Chicken and I had made some pretty amazing progress. Can you tell what it's going to be yet? Let me know down in the comments. And if you want more Zozo adventures, sub and hit that bell to never miss another one. From day 23 to day 26, a wild Enderman approached me as I was taking in the scenery of my base. Pikachu, I'll get you. I've got plenty of Thundershocks, so come and get it. The Enderman attacked, and I was able to fight back effectively by using my electrical attacks. After I destroyed the Enderman with a lightning strike, it dropped a whole bunch of shark tooth arrows. Way cool! I always thought I'd have to be a surfing Pikachu to get a hold of this many shark teeth. Afterwards, I headed out through the Badlands to give the shark tooth arrows a shot. The next Enderman I find will be no match for a Pikachu with arrows! I was shooting some weak skeletons to test the weapon when I came across a wandering trader carrying an inventory full of goods. Good afternoon, wandering trader! Actually, my name is Wally. I am, in fact, a wandering trader. I've been wandering through these dangerous badlands and looking for a nice, safe base to peddle my wares. Do you know anywhere like that? I do. I happen to be the owner of a prime secret base located in the alien fields. That sounds promising. As long as it's safe. You won't be disappointed. I'm Zozo, by the way. I brought Wally to the base and built a small storefront where he could sell his items. I wanted to make extra special sure that it was as safe as he wanted it to be. It turns out that Wally had the same idea. By the time I was done constructing his store, the wandering trader had built a perimeter wall around the entire base. Better safe than sorry, you know. You got that right. From day 27 to day 31, I talked a bit more with Wally the wandering trader. I figured someone as well-traveled as him would probably know many things about the world that my Pikachu self wouldn't. Ask me anything you wish, Zozo. Information is free of charge. Have you ever heard of a special food item called the Dynamax candy? The Dynamax candy? I've certainly heard stories about it. They say that whoever eats it gains the ability to grow into a gigantic version of themselves with unbelievable power. That sounds like exactly what I would need to turn the tables on Baroden the Conjurer. Can you tell me where I can find it? I don't know exactly where it is, but there is a pixie in the bamboo jungle to the east who I heard the stories of the Dynamax candy from. If you can find her, maybe she knows more. A bamboo jungle, huh? I've been there before! I gathered all my best gear and went back towards the bamboo jungle just like Wally the Wandering Trader suggested. It was a far journey for a Pikachu, but I was a little bigger and stronger than I was at the start of my Pokemon journey. But just because I was a higher level didn't mean the challenges wouldn't get tougher as well. The Vindicator standing in my way was proof of that. Not so fast there, Pikachu. You may be one of the world's most famous masks, but you're not getting past me. I guess you're not a Pokey fan. Oh well, if you're gonna fight me, then I'm gonna win. Thunderbolt! I used my lightning strike to make a first impression, then hit the Vindicator several times with my iron sword. He tried to fight back, but my attacks were much faster. Ouch! Why does Pikachu always get what Pikachu wants? The Vindicator ran away to fight another day. I wondered if we'll end up crossing paths again. From day 32 to day 35, I continued my journey through the bamboo jungle until I was able to meet up with the pixie that Wally the Wandering Trader had mentioned. Hey there, I heard you might know about the Dynamax candy. Oh wow, you're a Pikachu. I'm a huge fan. I never thought I'd meet you in person. Er, <laughs> well, in Dixie. Thank you, that's very nice. But I was hoping you could tell me about the Dynamax candy. Yeah, I know all about it. Can I have your autograph first? I feel like this conversation is going in circles. While I was trying to get more specifics out of the pixie, we were interrupted by the sudden appearance of Broden the Conjurer. That's me, Pikachu. Go make your own. Besides, it's a defective Pikachu anyway. I'm here to destroy it so I can make a better one. 
both of us ran for cover to hide from him. Once I was hidden, I noticed that the pixie was also in my hiding spot. It's too dangerous. You should get away from here while I distract him. No way. He just said he wanted to destroy you. That's a really rude thing to do to anyone, especially a Pikachu. I'll be fine. I've gotten away from him before. You should go to my base. We'll talk about the Dynamax candy there. I get to go to Pikachu's base? Woohoo! If you make it back there, I'll tell you everything I know about the Dynamax candy. Pixie flew away, leaving the area of the battle. Without having to worry about her safety, I could escape Brode and the Conjurer on my own. Come out, Zozo! I'm going to destroy you! You'll have to catch me first! I fired a few lightning strikes at him to confuse him and ran for another hiding spot. Broden began to follow me, so I used a lightning strike on a different block of bamboo jungle to confuse him. Where are you hiding? Once he didn't know about my hiding spot, I used my Pikachu speed to flee from battle. From day 36 to day 39, I was back at my base, building a small nest for my new pixie friend to live. Thanks for letting me stay at your base. As promised, I'll tell you everything about the Dynamax candy. I've been looking forward to hearing you say that. The Dynamax candy has been hidden for a very long time because its power could be devastating in the wrong hands. But the old spellcaster who hid it away wrote down its true location in his book of secrets. That way, if it ever needed to be used to defeat a great evil, there would be a way to retrieve it. That's exactly what I need it for. Where did this old spellcaster used to live? In the blue giant taiga. His book of secrets should still be there. But be warned, no one who has gone to the blue giant taiga has ever returned. I'm not just anyone. I'm a Pikachu. This should be no problem for me. By the way, I saw you were working on a statue, and I made some additions to it. I went and looked at the statue to see what they had added, and was very impressed by what I saw. That's some excellent building there, Pixie. I wanted to do what I could to make this the best Pikachu base ever. From day 40 to day 43, I went to visit the storefront of Wally the Wandering Trader that I built into my base. What's happening, Wally? Zozo, good to see you. I've actually heard of an intriguing rumor about a nearby cave. It is said to contain a small fortune in diamonds. Whoa, diamonds! Having some of those would go a long way towards better gear. I better go check this out. Yes, but be careful. It is said that the Hydra has made its lair in the cave and is eating everyone who tries to take the diamonds. I went to the cave that Wally the Wandering Trader had mentioned, and just like he said, there were plenty of diamonds ripe for mining. Didn't he also say there was a... I heard the many heads of a Hydra roar as the monster showed itself. A Hydra! That's what Wally warned me about. At first, I tried using my sword, but then I remembered that Hydras can easily regenerate their heads. So I dodged back and tried my lightning strike. It was a tough fight, and I had to keep avoiding the Hydra's attacks, but I took the beast down and was able to claim the treasure inside the cave. I mined the diamonds and decided to give both my sword and pickaxe a long-awaited upgrade. Now I had a diamond sword and a diamond pickaxe. From day 44 to day 49, I arrived in the blue giant taiga, the dangerous biome from which nobody was said to return. There's a first time for everything, though. I journeyed through the terrain until I encountered a Dread Scuttler. My speed was much higher, so I kept my distance and pelted it with shark tooth arrows. Once the Dread Scuttler was weak enough, I used a lightning strike to finish it off. The mobs here are definitely tough. I had better stay on guard. Oh, skeletons! No, have mercy! The voice was coming from a fiery hippogriff who was being chased by a band of evil-looking skeletons. I decided that I should help him out. Back off, you nasty skeletons! I'm a Pikachu with a diamond sword, and I'm not afraid to use it! It was no easy feat to defeat them all, but when I managed to win, the fiery hippogriff was really impressed with my strength in battle. Wow, I've never seen a Pikachu fight like that. I've actually never seen a Pikachu either. I'm Zozo. I was actually conjured here by the evil Broden, and I'm looking for a book of secrets here in the blue giant taiga. Oh, I've heard of that. I was actually the old spellcaster's prized fiery hippogriff. We were as close as a trader and a Pokemon. Oh, that's awesome. Can you take me to the book? Sadly, it's been a long time since the old spellcaster was alive and I've been chased around by the Tundra's monsters ever since. I bet we can get closer to the book if we retrace my steps, though. From day 50 to day 53, I followed the fiery hippogriff as he led me deeper into the blue giant taiga in the hopes that we could find any of his old master's belongings that could lead us to the book. Hey, Zozo, uh, if this goes well, do you, do you think you could introduce me to Charizard? I've always wanted to meet him. 
I actually don't know any other Pokemon, even though I'm a Pikachu. But let's not worry about that now. I'm sure Charizard would be proud to know you. Oh, shucks. I sure hope so. A little later, the fiery Hippogriff and I split up to cover more ground, and I ran into the Vindicator, who gave me some trouble at the Bamboo Forest. How many times do I need to teach you a lesson, Vindicator? There won't be a lesson. I'll be vindicated in the end, because I am a Vindicator. The only thing you are is going down! We battled, and I easily took him out using my diamond sword. I decided to continue searching the area of the blue giant taiga I was in. But with so much ground to cover, it felt like I was getting nowhere. If only the old spellcaster was here himself to tell me how to find his old stuff. Actually, I am! A ghost! Yes, I may be a ghost, but before that, I was the old spellcaster who hid the Dynamax candy. But you could just tell me directly where the Dynamax candy is hidden away. Oh, yeah. Well, the truth is, I kind of forgot where it was. Guess I'll have to keep looking for your book then. I guess so. But know this, young Pikachu. Strength does not come from your size. It comes from the size of your strength. From day 54 to day 57, I returned to my base and found that all my friends had been expanding it with new sections since I was away. Wow. Wally had created a marketplace so that other merchants could sell things here in the future. Excellent market, Wally. You might start bringing in some trainers as customers. Thanks, Zozo. Consider yourself the company mascot. Never heard that one before. Next, I visited the Pixie, who had built a Pikachu fan club where all of my biggest fans could hang out. And I'm the club president. Afterwards, the Iron Chicken approached me with some not-so-good news. A Dread Ghoul came by and did some damage to the base before we made our expansions, and he ran off with the diamond helmet that I crafted for you. I went out into the alien fields to hunt down that Dread Ghoul and reclaim the diamond helmet that was stolen from my base. It wasn't that long until I found the mob, and with my lightning strikes I was able to destroy it without getting too close. When it went down, it dropped Iron Chicken's diamond helmet. It was a gift for me, after all. I'm sure he'll let me keep it. From day 58 to day 62, I was woken up from a nap by Iron Chicken, who wanted to show me how the construction on the statue was progressing. Since we're not conjurers, everything we make takes hard work. And hard work pays off. The statue is looking fantastic so far. I walked around the statue to get a closer look and noticed to my shock that an Enderman was standing right there. What are you doing here? What else? I'm here to bring down this Pikachu base for our boss, Broden the Conjurer, and I'm gonna destroy you too. Just try it, Enderman. I zapped the Enderman with my lightning strikes, frying him up like a toasty puffin. Who is next? I heard the other Enderman wreaking havoc across the alien fields, so I quickly rushed out of my base to deal with the Enderman menace. I defeated all the Endermen that had been attacking around the base very quickly by using my lightning strikes and quickly searched inside the base to see if every one of my friends were still alive. Unfortunately, the Endermen had done their worst and I saw Wally destroyed by an Enderman. The Endermen ran away and I vowed revenge. From day 63 to day 66, I went back to the blue giant taiga in order to find the Book of Secrets. The sooner I can eat that Dynamax candy, the sooner I can defeat Broden and save everyone from his cruelty. After a lot more searching, I found the book pinned to a tree. I picked the book up and read what was inside. The Dynamax candy must be kept out of the clutches of evil because it could grant any being that eats it the ability to grow gigantic. Therefore, I am leaving it in the trusted care of my spellcasting apprentice, Broden the Conjurer. No, the Dynamax candy is with Broden. That's the worst place it could be. An Enderman ran up behind me, ready to fight. Somehow I knew it was the same one that had destroyed Wally the Wandering Traitor. I got ready for a fight. So, you found the book. Too bad it won't do you any good. I learned plenty, Enderman, and I'm not scared of you or your boss. How adorable. Now suffer like your friend did. The Enderman attacked me with his long arms, so I countered with my diamond sword. I knew agility would be the key to winning this fight, so I circled around him and landed hit after hit. This is for Wally! Now that I had gotten revenge, it was time to pay the spot I was conjured into a visit. From day 67 to day 70, I went to the alien fields and found the enemy base in the form of a magical mansion. It was guarded by an Enderman, so I just knew that it had to be where Broden had been entrusted to guard the Dynamax candy. There was no sign of the Conjurer himself, so I snuck in and began to search through the entire base. Because I was quick and nimble, I easily avoided all of the Enderman guards until I ran into a mutant Enderman who spotted me immediately. 
<laughs> you can't hide from me, you defective Pikachu. I'm going to do what the others couldn't and destroy you once and for all. The mutant Enderman's attack were much stronger than the ordinary kind. If I didn't have my diamond helmet, I would have already been down for the count. I was losing hearts fast, and my electric attacks were barely doing anything to him. This is what my shark tooth arrows are for. I switched my bow and hit the mutant Enderman with a bunch of arrows. Then I attacked with my diamond sword. Now I see why Broden has been having so much trouble with you. Don't take me lightly just because I'm a Pikachu. I began to use my lightning strikes again, and this time they seemed to be having an effect. I didn't let up on my sword either and made sure this mutant Enderman felt the sting of every one of my attacks. <laughs> you may have beaten me this time, but I'll end you next time. The mutant Enderman retreated. I guess just because he was bigger and more mutated than the others didn't mean he was anything to be scared of. From day 71 to day 74, I proceeded to the treasure room of the enemy base. Now that the mutant Enderman was out of my way, I expected that the Dynamax candy would be there, but it wasn't there. Of course, Broden must have given up on his responsibilities a long time ago. The old spellcaster trusted him, and he turned totally evil. Not cool at all. Meanwhile, somewhere else in the base, Broden was laughing about the fact that I couldn't find the Dynamax candy. That foolish Pikachu thought I'd keep the Dynamax candy. I threw that thing out years ago. Who needs to guard the item that can defeat evil when you are evil? From day 75 to day 78, I made a swift return to my base and found that the Pixie and the Iron Chicken had done some more work on the base. Pixie had refurbished the shop where Wally the Wandering Trader had once sold his items and had made it into a Pokemon-themed gift store. Isn't this great? Now everybody who comes to visit the base will be able to have their own Pikachu merchandise. That's a really good idea. Wally would have wanted us to keep using his store. Iron Chicken's improvement was another form of defense. He reinforced the walls of the base to make them even more fortified. No Enderman is gonna get through this, Zozo. Actually, I think there is one who could get through. I better make sure he doesn't try anything funny. It turns out I was right to suspect that mutant Enderman would try to break through our walls. We have unfinished business, and I intend to finish that business. Not if I finish it first. I let loose a barrage of shark tooth arrows on the mutant Enderman, which did a lot of damage. You should have run while you had the chance. Pikachu! I used my lightning attack to weaken the mutant Enderman, then used my sword to deliver the final strike. I did it! My victory in the battle made me into an even higher level Pikachu with greater electrical power and speed. I could now perform a mega jump move that would get me free of any enemy's range of attack. And I've got 50 hearts now, too. I also noticed that the mutant Enderman dropped a hint when he was defeated, a page that was ripped out of the Book of Secrets. The only place to dispose of the Dynamax candy is in the fires of the Badlands. From day 79 to day 84, I went to the Badlands to follow the hint from the torn page. This place was where I first encountered Broden the Conjurer. Maybe the reason why he was here was to throw away the Dynamax candy so it could never be used against him. I didn't see anything that looked like the Dynamax candy, but I did notice a siren who was also scouting the area. Hey, are you looking for the Dynamax candy too? So you figured me out. I heard something about Broden throwing away a powerful weapon here, and I want to grab it so I can get revenge on him. Don't tell me, you're another conjured being like me? You got that right. Broden wanted to have me to himself until he didn't. I'm sure you must know the same pain, eh, Pikachu? I do! Maybe if we team up, we can take him down together! Sorry, but there's only one candy, and I've got a sweet tooth! The siren fired laser beams at me, and I knew that I had to fight back! I mega jumped up and used the lightning strikes to weaken the foe, before attacking with my diamond sword and winning! I didn't want to defeat you, Siren! You and I were the same! No, we're not! You're stronger! And because of that, I'm going to tell you that Broden probably took the Dynamax candy back to its rightful place. Why would he do that after he tried to destroy it? At first, I didn't know. I was just as confused as you were when I couldn't find it here. Back then, I saw how strong you were. You were the only thing Broden had conjured that might actually threaten him. 
so I'm sure he got the candy back in case he needs to use it on you. From day 85 to day 89, I returned to the blue giant taiga and began to make my preparations to go face Broden the Conjurer at his base. I knew he'd be stronger than any of his minions, so I enlisted the help of the fiery hippogriff to get more information about Broden. Your former master used to train Broden in spellcasting. Is there anything you can tell me about why he might have gone evil? From what I could remember, the old spellcaster used to say that magic is for solving problems, not for making them. And I think Broden disagreed. So even though he conjured everything he wanted, he was really just making problems for himself? Pretty much. He always had second thoughts after he conjured something because nothing he made could ever be good enough. This was especially true when he made the Dynamax candy. Broden made the Dynamax candy? Yeah, I think he did. And it was the one thing he made that he couldn't destroy. But he won't use it either. So if I can eat it, I'll be able to crush him. Thanks for your help, Fiery. Good luck. Do what the old spellcaster couldn't and teach Broden a lesson. From day 90 to day 94, I went into the same cave where I found the diamonds so I could gather materials for my strongest gear yet. In the darkest depths of the cave, I found a chest that contained a netherite ingot. Yes. These will do the trick. I used a nearby smithing table and combined the netherite with my diamond sword to upgrade it to a netherite sword. This weapon will be the one I'll use to break through Broden's base defenses and take the Dynamax candy for myself. From day 95 to day 97, I visited my friends at the base to tell them that it was almost time for me to leave. First, I visited Pixie, who had been looking at the statue and thinking about how to upgrade it. Hey, Zozo! The statue is almost done, but it needs a Pikachu's touch to be complete. I've got you covered, Pixie. I went to the statue and did the remaining work that was needed. The full version was a statue of Ash Ketchum, Pikachu's trainer from the very beginning. When I looked at the statue, there was only one thought that echoed through my mind. I want to be the very best, like no one ever was. You already are the best in my eyes. Thanks, Pixie. I said goodbye to her, then went to go see how Iron Chicken was doing. Is it almost time to face off against Broden? You know it, buddy. On day 98, I was still talking with Iron Chicken about the upcoming battle with Broden the Conjurer. It felt like we had been through so much in this crazy world ever since we were conjured into it. And soon, our troubles would be coming to an end. You're like a brother to me, Iron Chicken. I hope you know that. The same to you, Zozo. I say that we end this battle together as brothers. When you go to face Broden, I want to be there right by your side. Of course, you'll always be welcome on my adventures. And so will you when you watch me out there. Remember to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you can check out my other adventures. Don't forget to leave a comment about what I should do next. On day 99, Iron Chicken and I left the base and crossed the alien fields to arrive at Broden the Conjurer's magical lair. Are you ready for this, Iron Chicken? Let's do this, my brother in conjuration. I can't wait to defeat Broden once and for all. Yeah, we may have been brought into this world by a mean guy who didn't even want us, but we gotta meet each other, and now we're a family. We entered the enemy compound and fought off some weak skeletons, which were effortlessly ground into bones by my netherite sword. No bones about it. Even Iron Chicken was able to take down a bunch of skeletons by himself. Zozo, I'm tough as iron, but I think you should continue on alone. All right, I'll make sure to end this once and for all. On day 100, the last couple Endermen that Broden the Conjurer had left tried to stand in the way. Curse you darn Pikachu, you've sent us blasting off again and again, but not this time. By now, my electrical attacks were very capable of roasting the Endermen without much difficulty, so I cleared a path for myself to keep moving. Before long, I had reached the room where the Dynamax candy was stored. There it was, sweet as candy. I had to have it. Time to Pikachu on this candy. <laughs> I love puns. I gobbled up the candy and grew to gigantic size. I had become my mightiest form of all, Gigantomax Pikachu. I had 80 hearts and felt like my lightning was stronger than ever. Shortly after I ate the Dynamax candy, Broden entered the room. No, what have you done? You've gained the power of the Dynamax candy. I sure have. What now, Broden? How about this? He rushed towards me and dealt a heavy blow, but I was adamant to defeat him. So I countered with lightning strikes and brought my netherite sword into the fight with a vengeance. I conjured you into this world and I can unconjure you. No, you don't, Broden. This Pikachu is a free Pokemon. 
I hit him with my sword and then delivered the final strike of Max Lightning, taking him out for good! Guess it's all Pika now. On day one, I spawned into the alien fields as a Charmander! Oh wow, I'm a fire-type Pokemon! This is awesome! I wonder if I can collect enough XP to evolve into a Charizard! But before I knew it, something wet hit me in the face! It was some kind of water blast, so strong that it felt like it was shot out of a cannon! This could only mean one thing! I turned around and saw a big, powerful Blastoise laughing at me from a treetop! I knew I'd find a fire type around here somewhere. You'll make perfect target practice. Wait, so you're the one who hit me with that water blast? Why? I don't even know you. You don't need to know me, and I don't need to know you. You're a fire type, and I'm a water type. We're opposites, and that's why we should be natural enemies. That doesn't make any sense. Why can't we be friends just because we're different types? No, I think being enemies is way more fun. Now run away, before I drown you in water blasts! And then, he started blasting at me, so all I could do was turn and run away as fast as I could, before his water blast could do too much damage to me! That guy has some really scary beliefs! There's gotta be some way I can stop his ideas from spreading before everyone hates each other! On day two, I traveled away from my spawn point through the alien fields in search of experience points. With only 10 hearts, I wouldn't be winning any Pokemon championships. I'm also one hungry Charmander. Better find some food. I did some scrounging around the trees and managed to get some apples to refill my hunger bar. I do like them apples. Shortly after my meal, I was approached by a group of Squirtles, water-type turtle Pokemon that evolve into Blastoise. Hey, Fire-type, you aren't welcome around these parts. If you don't get lost, we'll spread you with water. Oh no, all of you must be listening to the hateful words of that narrow-minded old Blastoise. Don't this Blastoise, we're the Squirtle Squad, and we make sure everyone knows that water types are the best. Why are you being so mean? All I was doing was eating apples. Doesn't matter what you were doing, you're not the same type as us, so you're our enemy. Get him, boys! The Squirtles attacked all together, and I started losing hearts. I couldn't even fight back because they outnumbered me. Just then, I heard a voice from nearby. Hey, Squirtle Squad, leave him alone. It was a Bulbasaur, a grass-type Pokemon known for having a sprouted plant on its back. No, a grass-type! We're afraid of those because they're strong against us! The Squirtles ran away, leaving me hurt but alive, with half a heart remaining. I turned to the Bulbasaur and expressed my gratitude. Thank you for saving me. Those guys were going to tear me apart just for being a fire-type. You don't have to worry about that from me, new Charmander friend. Follow me. There's someone you should meet. On day three, Bulbasaur led me to a campfire where another fire type, a Flareon, was waiting. Boy, am I happy to see another fire type. No offense, Bulbasaur. You've been through a lot, so I forgive you. How about you go talk to Flareon? I listened to Bulbasaur and approached the campfire. Flareon greeted me with a nod, and I told him everything about what had happened to me because of Blastoise and his Squirtle Squad. That Blastoise has fully evolved. He should know better than to pick on Pokemon of different types, especially Pokemon of the fire type, because of how few of us there are compared to water types. Trust me, I felt that part firsthand. Those Squirtles totally outnumbered me. How am I supposed to get a moment's peace? It can be difficult, young Charmander Zozo. I've struggled a lot in my life because of how some other Pokemon have treated me, but I also have many friends who are different types than me, like Bulbasaur, who you've met. The more we get along, despite being different types, the less the beliefs of Pokemon like Blastoise can defect us. So, you're saying I should go out into the world and make friends with lots of different types of Pokemon? Precisely. And if you see another Pokemon being bullied because of what type they are, you should stand up for them. Pokemon of different types make a more balanced team after all. Wow, thanks Flareon. I think I know how to make life a little bit easier for all types of Pokemon. I'm gonna get out there and stop the hate. I left the campfire and returned to Bulbasaur, telling him about my new quest to stop the spread of Blastoise's terrible ideas. So that's why I'm going to find different types of Pokemon and get to know them. That sounds like a lot of fun. Can I come with you, Zozo? Sure, Bulbasaur. Let's be friends and work together. From day four to day five, I knocked down a tree for wood and crafted a wooden pickaxe which I used to gather stone. I think I'll make a whole set of stone tools. I cast aside my wooden pickaxe in favor of a stone pickaxe. I also crafted a stone sword to help protect myself from the next time I'm in a fight. Hey, Zozo, we should build a base around here. That way we'll have a place for all our new friends to hang out in. Great idea, Bulbasaur. It'll be a Pokemon home that welcomes all types. 
I laid the foundation for the base in stone and built two different rooms designed for Bulbasaur and myself. For Bulbasaur's room, I added lots of plants and green textures that were fitting for a grass type. My room had a fire pit and a bunch of coal to keep it warm. A fire type Pokemon needs to have fire after all. While our rooms were really different from each other, they were still close enough that we could visit each other. How do you like the room, Bulbasaur? It's very nice, Zozo. I'm glad you made it specially for me. It shows you're really accepting of different types of Pokemon. Awesome! I want everyone to feel welcome when they come to live here. I went outside to search for more materials. I was digging another hole when I popped a Sandslash, a fully evolved ground-type Pokemon. Before I could offer a friendly greeting, the Sandslash attacked me. It must have thought I was easy pickings because fire types are weak against ground types. Why can't we get along? I fought back using my sword and drove the Sandslash back underground. Before I knew it, I had won the fight and the experience points from the, well, experience. And it caused me to evolve into a Charmeleon. I learned how to use Fire Breath, and my number of hearts increased to 30. From day six to day eight, I traveled to the Black Forest in search of new Pokemon friends. Woods that are this deep and dark have to be hiding some truly mysterious Pokemon. And now that I'm a Charmeleon, I'm sure I can protect myself if I need to. It turned out that the one I needed to protect was another Fire-type Pokemon known as a Vulpix. Stop it, Beedrill, leave me be. I ran to where I heard the Vulpix's cries and saw that she was fending off a Beedrill, a poison bug Pokemon with powerful stingers. Buzz off, Beedrill. I dove into the fray and hit the Beedrill with my stone sword, which gave the Vulpix a chance to get to a safe distance. Beedrill tried hitting me with its needle stingers, but I dodged and hit it a few more times with my sword. Just as the Beedrill started to use its poisonous ranged attacks, I attacked with my fire breath, dealing super effective levels of damage. The Beedrill fainted, so I went to go check on Vulpix. Are you okay, Vulpix? I've had better days. I'm really lucky that a Charmeleon like you came along. Call me Zozo. I'm on a quest for all kinds of Pokemon friends. Hi, Zozo. Would you be able to help me one more time? I was poisoned by that Beedrill, and I need some help getting Peachy Berries to work like antidotes. Count on me. Flareon told me that us fire types have to stick together too. From day 9 to day 10, I walked through the Black Forest with Vulpix until we reached a berry bush that was covered in peach berries. I grabbed one of the berries off the shrub and fed it to Vulpix. How do you feel? I feel great, which means the poison status effect is cured. Thanks, Sozo. Sweet! We should stock up on some of these berries for the base, just in case anyone else is poisoned. I went back to the peach berry bush to gather more, but I was stopped when the ground shook. A dug trio burst up from the ground and stared me down with its three heads. I know a stomping around above my home. I'll have you earthquaking in your boots, Charmeleon. I didn't mean to disturb you, Mr. Dugtrio. I'll just take the berries and be on my way. You'll take nothing but a beat down, you fire-type brat. Dugtrio hit me with its powerful ground-type digging moves. I used my fire breath, but it barely did any damage. The ground Pokemon was also way too fast to hit with my sword. The only thing I could do was run away, back to Vulpix. I didn't get the berries. That's all right. You saved me, at least. You're a real friend, Zozo. Thanks, Vulpix. I'm heading back to my base now, and you're welcome to tag along. From day 11 to day 12, I constructed another room fit for a fire type so that Vulpix could live comfortably inside the base. It was nice to know that there was one more fire type friend who would be safe from the Squirtle Squad and Blastoise. Once I was finished with the room, I went to see Vulpix, who had been doing some building of her own. Hey, Zozo. I made us a storage room to store all of our food and other supplies. I looked around at the base and saw that Vulpix had done exactly what she said. The base was looking more like a home than ever before. That's really nice, Vulpix. Did you do this because you already like living here? You got it. I wanted to thank you for all you've done for me. I really look forward to seeing this place full of new Pokemon friends. It will be, Vulpix. And you're one of us now. Thank you. Truth is, I've needed a place to belong. For a while, I've been struggling because other types of Pokemon have picked on me. Especially because I was a fire Pokemon. Especially Blastoise and his Squirtle Squad. Don't worry, Vulpix. I'll make sure to create a world where nobody is picked on because of their types. After the base was renovated, I went down into the mines to get some stronger materials. I dug for iron ore and found enough to make some iron ingots. With that, I upgraded my stone sword and stone pickaxe to an iron sword and an iron pickaxe. Back on the surface, I discovered some sheep in the alien fields and went to work creating a pen to keep them in. Kinda weird that these are regular old non-Pokemon sheep, but oh well, I have sheep. 
From day 13 to day 15, I went to talk to my first Pokemon friend, Bulbasaur, about how I could evolve even further. Right now I'm a Charmeleon, but if I can become a Charizard, I'll be able to face that Blastoise on the same level. It's not that easy, Zozo. That Blastoise still has lots of experience, and his type is strong against yours. I still have to try. That big brute nearly waterlogged me when we first met, and now that I know he bullied Vulpix too, I'm all fired up. Maybe you should try facing off against the Squirtle Squad to gain experience fighting against water types. That's a great idea, Bulbasaur. Away I go. I returned to the Black Forest where I met Vulpix and called out for Squirtles to test my strength against. Come on out. You weren't so afraid of me when I was a Charmander. And we're not afraid now. Get set to get splashed, Fireboy. A lone Squirtle appeared, ready to take me on. I was game, so I drew my iron sword and fought against the turtle-like Pokemon. Now armed and evolved, I was having a much easier time holding my own, even though I was still taking a bit of damage. Give up, Chameleon. A fire type can't beat a water type. Stop thinking about other Pokemon just in terms of types. I used my fire breath to deal a bit of damage and distract the Squirtle before I swung the iron sword and finished him off like it was a metal claw attack. He dropped some experience, which I utilized to fully form into my most iconic form, the fire flying Pokemon, Charizard. Yeah, Charizard. I had 60 hearts and a brand new fireball attack that could be launched even farther than my fire breath and dealt way more damage. From day 16 to day 19, I took my newly evolved Charizard self on a trip to the Crag Gardens biome. I was feeling strong, getting used to being an evolved Pokemon. I couldn't wait to use my new Charizard powers to defend all types of Pokemon from those who would hate and divide them. While I was wandering around, I found a book of information. It's like an old-fashioned Pokedex. The inside of the book had a Pokemon article about Charizard and Blastoise. This would probably be worth the read. While both are considered to be powerful and fully evolved Pokemon, Charizard and Blastoise have a number of differences between each other. As a water type, Blastoise is known to be strong in a battle with the fire type Charizard. But even so, Charizard has always been the more popular Pokemon, beloved by trainers and other Pokemon everywhere. This has made Blastoise extremely jealous and obsessed with proving his superiority. I see. So Blastoise started this grudge against other types of Pokemon because he felt weak on the inside. I'd almost feel bad for him if he wasn't causing so much hate. I put the book down and found that I was surrounded by a bunch of Squirtles from the Squirtle Squad. We had you took out one of our Squirtles and evolved, so we're here to get even. Blastoise is making you do this, isn't he? I guess I'll have to teach you a lesson through battle. I used my fire breath attack to hit the Squirtles all at once. Then I used my iron sword to deal strong damage to each of them. This battle went very differently than the one when I was a Charmander. Even though I was still outnumbered, I managed to defeat all the Squirtles and make them faint. Oh yeah, I'm strong enough to protect myself now. From day 20 to day 22, I gathered more iron from the mines so I could craft my first piece of iron armor and decided to take the iron ingots I made from the iron ore and create an iron chest plate. Now I could have defenses where it counts. Now for the true test of my fully evolved power, I'm gonna go see if I can defeat that mean dug trio in the black forest. I went to the same bush where the peacha berries were and waited for that wild dug trio to appear. And soon he did. Hey, aren't you that Charmeleon? Looks like you've evolved, but you're still no match for me. We'll see about that. Charizard, attack! I opened the battle with my brand new fireball. It didn't deal too much because Dugtrio was a ground type, but it got his attention. His melee attacks and speed were still a force to be reckoned with. But with my newly improved defenses, I was able to tank several hits and deal damage back with my sword. Before long, Dugtrio was begging for mercy. Please, Charizard, no more. I didn't know a fire type could be this strong. You're about to see how strong I really am. I spare you, Dugtrio. Really? You're not gonna knock me out? Of course not. All I wanted to do was show you I could protect myself. We could even be friends now. Well, you're all right, Zozo the Charizard. Have the berries if you want. Dugtrio disappeared back underground. I was about to celebrate my victory and the fact that I resolved the battle peacefully when Blastoise appeared. Blastoise! Looks like the little Charmander has grown up into a Charizard. I knew I should have gotten rid of you when you were small. Now we're destined to be rivals. You can stop this now if you want to, Blastoise. Water types and fire types don't need to be enemies. You think you're better than me, don't you? Well, you're not. 
Charizard might be a lot of people's favorite Pokemon, but there are more water types than any other type of Pokemon. Your fire type should leave us alone and stop stealing our spotlight. Then Blastoise stomped away, furiously. We didn't end up fighting this time, but unless he let go of his hatred towards fire types, someday we would have to. From day 23 to day 26, I returned to base with several bushels of Pichu Berries, which I planted outside the base so that any Pokemon living here could cure poison status effects. Vulpix was very happy since it was her who had trouble getting the berries when she was poisoned. Now that you're a Charizard, it seems like there's a chance for things to get better for fire types. It'll take a lot more than me to make the world a place where all Pokemon can live in harmony, but I'll keep on doing my best. And part of doing my best was adding to my suit of iron armor. So I went back to the caverns and mined until I had enough iron material to craft myself an iron helmet and iron boots. With all this iron I'm wearing, I'm practically a steel type. When I was done crafting, I went outside to see that there was a great big wall built around the entire base. Vulpix was standing nearby, looking proud. Did you do this, Vulpix? Yes, I did. What you said about doing your best struck a chord with me. I wanted to do my best too. You did awesome, Vulpix. I'm so glad you're living here with us. From day 27 to day 31, I was exploring the Karag Gardens when I met a type of Pokemon I had never seen before. Lapras, the ice-type transportation Pokemon known for swimming along the waterways. Actually, Lapras had two types. It was a water type, too. Hello, are you that same Charizard that fought with the Squirtle Squad? Yep, that's me. Please don't tell me you want to get revenge for your fellow water types. Not at all. I'm glad that someone is teaching them not to mess with other types of Pokemon. That kind of thing gives us water types a bad name. Well, that's a relief. Good to know there are water types out there who don't listen to Blastoise. Blastoise doesn't even consider me a true water type because I'm part ice type. I get bothered by those Squirtles too. So sorry. Come to my base. It's welcome to all types of Pokemon. I returned to the base with Lapras and let them settle in. I decided I should make the base more inviting to outsiders, so I harvested some wool for my sheep and placed down some decorative banners. As soon as I was done, Bulbasaur ran up to me, looking panicked. Zozo, quick! It's the Squirtle Squad! They're attacking other types of Pokemon again! From day 32 to day 35, I ventured out into the alien fields to find the Squirtle Squad and stop them from causing trouble. I recognized the area as near the campfire where we had met Flareon many days prior. Oh no, Flareon, he's probably in trouble! And so are you! A bunch of Squirtles jumped out to attack me, but I managed to fend them off with my iron sword. Afterwards, I saw Flareon getting hit with attacks from other members of the Squirtle Squad. This'll show you, Flareon! Squirtle Squad for life! The Squirtles attacked again and destroyed Flareon right before my eyes! Flareon, no! I blasted the Squirtle Squad with fireballs and cut the rest of them down with my sword. If I see any more of you Squirtles on the Squirtle Squad again, I'm fighting you right then and there. From day 36 to day 39, I was in the Black Forest when I met a Caterpie, a friendly bug-type Pokemon who was crawling along through the tall grass. You startled me. I saw your wings and thought you were the flying-type Pokemon who had been attacking me. Charizard is a flying-type as well as a fire-type, but this one doesn't mean you any harm. Honest. That's good. It seems like Pokemon like me always have to worry about Pokemon of stronger types. You understand how that feels? I do understand, Caterpie. Take me to this flying type bully of yours so I can settle the score. Caterpie showed me to a clearing in the forest where a feral was swooping around. It must have been the fire type he mentioned. The pharaoh turned towards me and charged right at me. I shot a few fireballs at the pharaoh, defeating the bird in a single attack. I returned to Caterpie and told him that he wouldn't need to worry about pharaoh anymore. Thanks, Zozo. I knew I could trust a Charizard, even if you are a fire and flying type. Why's that? I know I'm nice, but still, how did you know you could trust me? Because everyone knows Charizard is a heroic Pokemon who defends the weaker Pokemon from danger. You're a hero, Zozo. I'm glad everyone thinks so highly of me, but being a Charizard doesn't make me better than anyone else. Is that what Blastoise thinks? From day 40 to day 43, I went back home to the base to check in with Bulbasaur about what we should do next regarding the Squirtle Squad. When I arrived, I noticed that Bulbasaur had added a bunch of couches to the base in order to make it look nicer. What's all this for, Bulbasaur? I'm inviting another Bulbasaur to the base so we can talk about Flareon. I wasn't the only other Bulbasaur he was friends with. Of course, you can have another Bulbasaur visit. I didn't know Flareon for very long, but he was a good Pokemon and had lots of friends. What happened to him wasn't fair. The Squirtle Squad has crossed a line that we can't forgive. 
If we don't fight them, there will never be peace between different types of Pokemon. You're right. We have to make it impossible for them to hurt any other Pokemon. Bulbasaur and I talked for a while longer before the other Bulbasaur showed up. I could tell the grass types wanted to be alone for a bit, so I went outside. There, I was greeted by Lapras. Hey Zozo, have you decided to take on Blastoise and the Squirtle Squad now? Yeah, the hate in some Pokemon goes too deep. And sadly, fighting might be the only way. If you've chosen to fight, then you should know there are other water types that follow Blastoise's scary beliefs. There is a Gyarados back in the Crag Gardens who is particularly nasty about it. Then I show him a thing or two. If he listens to reason, I'll spare him. But if not, I'll do whatever it takes to keep other Pokemon safe. From day 44 to day 49, I went to the Crag Gardens to seek out the nasty old Gyarados that Lapras mentioned. If Blastoise was gathering together water types to gang up on and hate other types of Pokemon, then I'd need to act quickly before he convinced too many of them. Sure enough, there was Blastoise himself. It was like he knew I'd show up here. Blastoise, I'm through letting you get away with trying to divide everyone. Uh, I'm not the problem. Charizard's like you are. Lapras must have told you I have friends out here. The traitor. Lapras was just trying to keep you from brainwashing more innocent water types into hating fire types. And now your Squirtle Squad has destroyed one of my friends. Take responsibility. No, you're a Charizard, not a Blastoise. You don't know how easy you have it. And now I'm going to make sure you never will. Stormy, I choose you. Blastoise withdrew from the area, leaving behind Starmie, the water and psychic type starfish Pokemon, to face me. <laughs> Bring it, Cheapazard. You are no match for my dazzling water type moves. That's what you think. I'll teach you to judge me by my type, Starmie. From day 50 to day 53, I started my struggle against Starmie. This was the first time I had faced off against a fully evolved water type Pokemon, and as I expected, it was tricky. But even so, I refused to back down in the face of one of Blastoise's followers. Why aren't you dead yet? I thought you fire types were supposed to be pushovers for us water types. Looks like you don't know as much about Pokemon as you think. Now check out my moves. I launched a few fireballs, then finished the job with my fire breath. After those fire type attacks, Starmie was weak and unable to fight. So I decided to attempt to communicate with the water type Pokemon. Why do you work for Blastoise in the first place, Starmie? Don't you know that he's hurting people? Yes, of course I know that. But if I defied him, I'd be cast out by the other water type Pokemon. I'm already part psychic, and that means I have to be loyal or else. That's just living by his narrow view of what Pokemon types are. What you know is wrong. Yes, I know. But what can I do? You can run away for now. I'll deal with Blastoise, and then you can return to this land when there is harmony between types. Starmie understood and fled. But before they ran away, they dropped a diamond, which I could use to make a stronger weapon. I thought a bit more about how Blastoise and his beliefs were making the world a more difficult place to live in. Even other water types weren't safe. Onwards to Gyarados! From day 54 to day 57, I searched through the Karag Gardens until I found the Gyarados that Lapras had mentioned. Sure enough, Gyarados attacked me on sight with a water blast. It then bit me, so I drew my iron sword and hit back. It was clear that this Gyarados really didn't like any other type of Pokemon and just wanted to hurt me. So I showed no mercy. With a blast of my fireball and a strike from my weapon, I took the flying water Pokemon down. When I got back to my base, Lapras was waiting to congratulate me for winning the battle. Now you've seen how far Blastoise has gone to make others believe the same terrible things he does. Yeah, all those water Pokemon, even the Squirtles, are just copying somebody they look up to. But his ideas have been hurting them by making them hurt others. And he won't take responsibility. That's why you're going to have to stand up to Blastoise and show the world that he's actually a loser. You have to succeed where the last Charizard failed. There was a Charizard that fought Blastoise before me? There was, but even defeating his rival didn't remove the hate from Blastoise's heart. Pokemon like him are never happy, even when they succeed. I had no idea how crazy this whole thing was. Blastoise is the worst! From day 58 to day 62, I expanded the farm so it could hold even more sheep. Down below in the mines, I used my iron pickaxe to dig out some diamonds, which combined with the diamond that Starmie had given me, 
allowed me to craft a heck and awesome new diamond sword. The diamonds I had left over went towards upgrading my pickaxe from iron to diamond. Once I was done mining, I saw that Bulbasaur had added a brand new fireplace outside. Whoa, Bulbasaur, you made a fireplace even though you're a grass type? Of course, hanging out with you and seeing how nice you are has made me totally unafraid of fire. Flareon would be so proud of me. I guess the Pokemon who are living here had started to adapt to being around each other's types, so being comfortable around fire had become no big deal. The harmony between the types that we've been striving for feels closer every day. From day 63 to day 66, Fulpix came to visit me in the mine. She had a hint about a biome I hadn't yet explored. The Dead Sea is home to a bunch of Pokemon I used to be friends with before the Squirtle Squad chased me away. You think we might be able to recruit any of your old friends? I don't know. The Squirtle Squad is pretty unforgiving and might have already chased them away. Or worse. But you should try anyway. I went to the Dead Sea and looked around, but at first there didn't seem to be any Pokemon there. Then I heard a buzzing noise from behind me. I have finally found you. I turned around in shock and saw a bug-type Pokemon, Butterfree, flying in the air. Do you know Vulpix? Huh? Who's that? Okay then, this is about me. Are you an enemy? What? No, no, Zozo, it's me, Caterpie. I evolved into a Metapod and then a Butterfree. Oh, good to see you. I've been so on edge lately that I guess I was expecting a fight. You're right to be careful around here. I've heard Blastoise's base is here in the Dead Sea somewhere. I was looking for it so I could help you out. Well, thanks, Butterfree. I guess I can help you find it while I'm here. From day 67 to day 70, Butterfree and I explored the Dead Sea for any signs of Blastoise and his Squirtle Squad. I appreciate that you remembered me even after you evolved, Butterfree. You saved me once, and I didn't want to see another Charizard get absolutely washed by Blastoise. This time, he'll win and prove him wrong. Like I always say, I'll do my best. We continued through the Dead Sea until we encountered a wild Eradicate, a normal type rodent Pokemon with an abnormal need to super fang us into submission. But instead of running away, I used my fire breath to burn the Eradicate and scare him off. Yeah, run away! You don't want to fight us! There were so many Pokemon in the world that were quick to jump into a fight, probably because that's what they were used to. Pokemon battles are one thing, but all the fighting and hatred is getting us nowhere. A little bit later, Butterfree pointed out a military-looking fortress. There it is! The Blastoise Fortress! I found it! All right, Butterfree! Well done! This is as far as I'll go for now. Feel free to keep exploring, Charizard, but don't do anything reckless! From day 71 to day 74, I decided to head back home to get prepared to face Blastoise while thinking about the Pokemon that had helped me make it this far. And all the subscribers like you that have helped me make it to 1 million subscribers! Remember to search ZOZO for more of my videos! Home isn't far now, here goes! Kept on walking, but then my progress was halted by the sudden appearance of Blastoise himself! Stormy fell to defeat you! I should have known that dual type was good for nothing! Awful thing to say about one of your supposed friends! You're a real disgrace, Blastoise! No, you're the disgrace here! Taste my water blast! Blastoise hit me with a water energy blast, and it almost caused me to faint! No way! Am I still this much weaker than him? That's what you get, Charizard! You think you're so popular, but I'm gonna make sure you face the same fate as the last Charizard! I was still too weak, so I ran away as fast as I could! From day 75 to day 78, after my crushing defeat at the hands of Blastoise, I hid myself away inside the base in complete shame. That was my chance to take him on and prove in front of the whole world that his beliefs were wrong. If I couldn't defeat him, he'd still be out there making trouble for other Pokemon, and fire types especially would get hurt because of me. I was still a crying Charizard when Lapras came to visit me to cheer me up. It's okay, Zozo. Nobody expected you to be able to beat him on the first try. Plus, what's more important is the friendships we build with each other. That's the real way to stop Blastoise from winning. Come on, out of your room. I listened to Lapras and walked outside to see the watchtowers that had been added to the base. Even now, the Pokemon who had come to live here were together to make it better. Thanks, Lapras. I just remembered what is really important. Sometime later, Bulbasaur handed me an item of mysterious power. What is this, Bulbasaur? It's a lava bottle, but all of us here at the base made it stronger by adding our elemental energies to it. 
If you drink it, you'll be able to gain the power of our friendship. Wow, I might even be able to evolve past my limits with this. I drank the lava bottle, and the power of friendship caused me to mega evolve into the mighty and unstoppable Mega Charizard X. I'm a fire and dragon type now. My fireball upgraded even further into a dragon fireball, and I had 100 hearts to boot. From day 79 to day 84, I went through the Dead Sea with my new mega form and fought against some pure water type Vaporeons who were loyal to Blastoise. The Dragon Fireball's power was many times stronger than the regular Fireball and hit with Dragon Energy, so it was effective against water types too. Now this is the power of friendship. I'll be able to use this form to defeat Blastoise. I just know it. As I took stock of my surroundings, an energetic electric type Pokemon approached Jolteon. Hey, nicely done. Those Vaporeons were not nice to anybody. By the way, I'm Jolteon. You might have met my brother Flareon. He was a good guy. Shame what happened. But hey, you'll do something about it, right? Right? Whoa, whoa, slow down. You talk so fast. But yeah, I'm looking to bring peace between the types by facing off against Blastoise. Oh, wow, you're a good guy too. Just like Flareon. Boy, that's just incredible. Flareon would have been so very proud. I hope so. A lot of people miss him. And I've been fighting this whole time to make sure what happens to him isn't going to happen again. That's excellent! Stupendous! Super duper cool! Here, take this diamond helmet. It'll guard your head from Blastoise's attacks. Jolteon gave me some diamond leggings, which I immediately equipped. This would come in handy in the next battles. Thanks, Jolteon. I consider you a friend. And soon, Pokemon of all types will be able to be friends! From day 85 to day 89, I went back to the alien fields to check in with the others at the base. I'll be so excited to hear that I met Jolteon. But when I arrived, Things were not as I had left them. The wall and watchtowers had been damaged, and the Squirtle Squad was wreaking havoc inside of the base. Yeah, Squirtles, take down this place. Pokemon of different types shouldn't live together. That's not true. This base is for everyone who wants to live here, regardless of type. I hit one of the Squirtles with a Dragon Fireball, taking him down with one hit. Oh no, it's Mega Chazad X. We gotta get out of here, boys. Where do you think you're going? I rushed at the Squirtles and used my diamond sword and fireballs to hew through their ranks. A few managed to escape, so I followed them through the alien fields until they were nowhere near the base. Looks like the coast is clear. I better return to the base and make sure nobody was hurt. While I was walking through the fields, I noticed an incredibly rare Pokemon floating around in the air. No way, is that? It was Mew, the mythical psychic type Pokemon that has almost never been seen before. Mew! That's me. Mew, the world is full of danger right now. I'm trying my best to bring harmony to the world, but it's really hard to change people's minds. Don't worry, Zozo. I've been struggling with the same problem. I have the psychic power to talk to many people in their dreams, but I never know what to say. Tell them this, Mew, that we should all try to be friends, no matter what type we are. Yes, I like that. That just might work. I'll try to remind everyone what is the same rather than what is different. Thanks, Mew. From day 90 to day 94, I trekked back through the Dead Sea and got a better look at Blastoise's fortress. There were some formidable looking cannons mounted on the side of the fortress that would probably blast me if I got closer. I could see Squirtle Squad patrols all across the base. But all that doesn't scare me. I'm gonna use my mega evolved power to bulldoze through anything in my way. A water Pokemon came careening towards my location. It wasn't a Squirtle, but it looked slightly similar only larger and more warlike. So I ran away, but he caught up to me. Tan hut, attention. I am Commander War Turtle of the Squirtle Squad. I hear you're the upstart firebrand who is standing in the way of our glorious future. My glorious future? All you guys do is make life harder for anyone who isn't you. That's because water types are the best. We're strong, we're good swimmers, and we're the majority. So everyone should have to do what we want. If what you want is to hurt others, then I can't accept your worldview. Game on, War Turtle. I hit him with my fire breath and drew my sword. His defensive shell would be hard to crack, but in Mega Charizard X form, I was fast and I was furious. I hammered him over and over again with melee attacks from my sword. From day 95 to day 97, I continued to chip away at War Turtle's health, but the water Pokemon was resilient. I could see his strength in battle was why he had become the commander of the Squirtle Squad. All that, and the fact he's completely bought into all of Blastoise's ideas about different types of Pokemon. War Turtle used a water blast. It wasn't as powerful as Blastoise's, but it was still super effective. He followed up with a combo of powerful melee attacks that had me barely hanging on. 
Guess I've got no choice. I have to use that move. I unleashed dragon fireballs. Four of them. The dragon power caught War Turtle off guard and dealt enough effective damage to put him in his place. Hey, that was a fire trap move. What a cheap trick. It's a move I learned through the power of friendship. Someone like you who think a Pokemon's type is all they can be would never understand. Whatever, Zozo. It's not gonna matter when Blastoise brings down the rain across the land and creates a world for water types and only water taps. You mean he's even willing to do that? I thought Blastoise was bad enough, but he really can't live in a world where anyone is a different type? It'll be a perfect world. I wish I could have seen it, but I settle for that horrified look on your face. Goodbye, Zozo. Enjoy your last few days alive. War Turtle passed on, but he was oddly proud of himself. It was sad that he had bought into his hate so completely. Brainwashed until the end. Now that I knew what Blastoise was planning to do, I went to warn the others about the coming flood. On day 98, I said my goodbyes to my friends who were living on my base as I prepared to go and take down the Blastoise who'd caused all this trouble. First, Lapras. You can do this, Sozo. Over these last 100 days, you've proven yourself to be a true hero. You will unite the Pokemon world. And then, Vulpix. You can heal the Great Divide, Sozo. I believe in you. You can right the wrongs of this imperfect world. And finally, the first ever friend I'd met here, Bulbasaur. Do it for Flareon, Zozo. It's what he would have wanted. On day 99, I made my way back to the Dead Sea. I needed to conserve every ounce of my strength if I wanted to defeat Blastoise and his agenda of hate. But when I reached the outside of Blastoise's fortress, I saw a large gang of Squirtles. This was extremely bad news. If I fought those Squirtles, I'd lose energy and be weakened in my fight against Blastoise. Oh, this is terrible. I don't know what to do. That's when I heard a fluttering sound and saw Butterfree floating next to me. This is where I may be of assistance, Zozo. You helped me, now I'll help you. Let me distract the Squirtles while you take on Blastoise. It'll all be worth it if you can bring peace to the land. Thank you, Butterfree. I'll make sure that your risk won't be in vain. On day 100, Butterfree rushed in and distracted the Squirtles while I entered the fortress and came face to face with Blastoise for the first time in quite some time. Finally, you nasty little fire type. You've grown the courage to come and fight me. This is the final battle. Whoever wins will decide the fate of all the Pokemon in the overworld. I'm not here to fight you, Blastoise. What? This is impossible. It must be some kind of dirty fire type trick. You just want me to let my guard down so you can burn me to a crisp. Don't be silly, Blastoise. Aren't you tired of all this fighting, all this hate? Haven't we both lost too many people? But, but, I'm a water type. That makes me better. If I don't have that, what do I have? You can have anything you want, Blastoise. You can decide who you are, not just what you are. We can all be our own people and be friends. You just need to let all this hate and pain go. Blastoise thought about it for a long moment before sighing. I'm so sorry for everything I've done. Can you ever forgive me? I can try, and you can try too. Come back to my base with me, Blastoise. We'll get it all smoothed over. Thank you, Zozo. You haven't just saved everyone else. You've saved me too. Just like that, the overworld was saved. Not with violence, but with kindness and understanding. On day one, I was flying toward the ground in a meteor. It got faster and faster until finally I crash landed in a city. Oh, gross. I'm just a pile of goo. No, wait. I'm Venom. I knew I wasn't going to be able to survive 100 days without a host, so I needed to find someone or something quick. It was time to embrace the dark side and truly become the symbiote. I looked around the city I had landed in. Whoa, these buildings are huge. I was admiring all the buildings when all of a sudden I was attacked by a mean stray dog. I knew I couldn't beat him, not being a puddle of goo with only three hearts, so I hurried and squirmed down a drain. Phew, that was close. The drain led me down into the sewer. I explored down a tunnel before I found a little corner. It seemed safe enough, so I went to sleep for the night. What a way to spend the first night on a new planet. On day two, I woke up with a headache. Wait, I don't even have a brain. How could I have a headache? I shrugged and started up out of the drain to the same alleyway where I had landed. I looked around and saw the stray dog was gone. I went squirming around and figured if I could climb up the pipes, then I must be able to climb up the walls too. I started going up a building when I noticed an open window. Oh, maybe I can hide in there. I crawled in and saw that it was an apartment. Nobody seemed to be around, so 
I made myself at home. I smelled food, so I tried to open the fridge, but it wouldn't budge. I guess I wasn't strong enough to open doors yet. My whole being grumbled. My hunger meter was dangerously low. I knew I needed food, so I kept looking around. But then I heard a noise. I tried to freeze, but then I felt something hit me. Ouch! I dodged and realized someone was attacking me. Hey, stop that! He swung again. That's it, pal. Time for you to see what a puddle can do. I used the one ability I had, morphing. Hey, get off of me! I climbed up and morphed into him, getting absorbed into his body. Hey, where'd you go? I decided I should probably stay inside this guy until I could find some more food. Maybe he could take me to get some. The guy looked around and shrugged. I guess he assumed I was gone. He went back to sleep for the rest of the day, leaving me starving. On day three, the guy I had morphed into got up and made himself some breakfast. He was able to open the fridge. He had some fruit and it was fine, but I didn't really like it. I wanted something else. Something meatier. He went downstairs and he got onto his motorcycle. He even morphed inside of him. It was really loud. Maybe he would take me to get some better food, though. We went to the park with some benches and a pond, and he threw bread at some ducks. I couldn't handle it anymore. I was so hungry at this point, I decided to tell him what I needed. Brains! He panicked, not knowing it was me talking. I. Need. Brains! Stop it, Eddie. You're not hallucinating. You don't have time for this. Okay, so it seems like this guy's name was Eddie. Perfect. Of course we had time for it. I was hungry. Eddie, I need brains now. I started to wiggle, which made Eddie move. Maybe I could control him. Hey, what's going on? Help! A police officer was nearby and he came running towards us. Oh no, I didn't want him to hurt us, but maybe if I could have his brain. The man got to us and I used Eddie to smack him. I'm so sorry, I don't know what's happening. The police officer started yelling for backup. Oh no, no, we gotta go. No, we need brains. Eddie started to run away. I wasn't strong enough yet, so I couldn't make him stop. What are you doing? I'm starving. Yeah, well, we don't eat brains. Oh, I'm talking to myself. We got back to Eddie's apartment where he soon fell asleep. I would have to try something else tomorrow. On days four to five, I woke Eddie up. Come on, it's time to eat. I tried with all my strength to get him up and somehow managed to get his legs moving a little bit. What in the world? Eddie, stop resisting me. I need food and you need to get it for me. Whoa, wait, you're not just in my head? No, I'm Venom. Or as you remember, the little black puddle you tried to beat with the newspaper. He started to go toward the fridge. I want brains, no more fruit. I told you, I don't eat brains. But I do. I started to get really angry. My hunger meter was so low, I was on the brink of dying. And Eddie didn't even care. I needed to get food. And fast. I reached out using all of my strength and manifested my true form. We are Venom. And we are getting some food. And with that, I jumped through the window. On day six through eight, I fell down into the alleyway near the stray dog I saw earlier. Maybe I could eat his brain. He saw us and ran away, though. No, no brains. Eddie was talking to me, but I was in control of our body now. I'm going to die if I don't get some food soon. Don't you care about me, Eddie? I don't even know you. I started down the alleyway, keeping an eye out for anything that looked tasty. Like I said, I am Venom, or now we are Venom. I need a host in order to thrive, and you are perfect, Eddie. Well, not perfect, but we are a good match. I ran up the side of the building and onto the rooftop. It looked like even as Eddie, I still had my same power. I ran across some buildings and up some taller ones. Eventually, we got to the edge of the water. All of a sudden, I saw what looked like a guy attacking a woman. She screamed out for help. Without thinking, I charged forward and grabbed the man. Then I realized he wasn't a man. He was a... Oh, it's a zombie. I didn't know what a zombie was doing in the city, but it looked tasty. I defeated him and quickly ate some of the meat he left behind. Gross, Venom. That was a zombie. Mm, yes, he tasted interesting. I realized that the woman was standing there, staring at us. We are Venom. Are you okay? She nodded. Yes. Was that really a zombie? Uh, yes. Yes, it was. He probably would have eaten my brain if you hadn't come along. Zombies eat brains too? We might be friends. The woman started to tremble. She looked really scared. You're scaring her, Venom. But not your brain. You are nice to us. She nodded again. Venom, let me talk to her. I let Eddie take control, and he walked up to the girl. I'm Eddie Brock. I'm a reporter. Did you see where that zombie came from? She pointed down the alleyway, towards an abandoned building. I was walking down the street when I saw the guy outside. I started walking faster, but then he followed me down the alleyway. Do you think there are more of them? I don't know, but we will find out. Eddie started to walk us toward the building, when the woman called out from behind us. Wait, I'm Ann. If you need help, call me. She gave us her number. I like her. Shut up. Excuse me? No, sorry, not you. Oh. Okay. She walked quickly down the alleyway and out of sight. I like her. So you said. Well, I guess I'm stuck with you. Want to go see what's up? Oh, yes. As long as I get to eat. On days 9 to 10, Eddie started to sneak toward the abandoned building. Hey, I want to come out. Venom, you're great and all, but you're kind of big. What do you mean? I mean, a minute ago, when you took form, you were only slightly bigger than me, but that's still something. 
Just wait until I take my true form. Huh? What? What? Never mind. I think I see a window we can sneak in. And he crept toward the window and looked inside. There didn't seem to be anyone there, or, and it was open, so we slipped inside. We continued through the room and towards the next door. And he opened it and we looked through. Still nothing. Just a dark hallway. Eddie didn't move. What are you waiting for? It's dark. I don't know if there's anything down there. We forced Eddie to walk forward and he did. We went down the hallway and saw another door at the end. This one had a bigger lock on it. You don't by chance pick locks, do you? Hmm, I can try. It turns out I had a special ability that would allow me to reach into door locks and trigger the mechanism, even without a key. The door was now unlocked. On days 11 to 12, Eddie opened the door and we immediately had to hide. There were a bunch of scientists around what looked like big tanks full of green liquid. Eddie ducked behind one, fast. Phew, I hope nobody saw us. What is this green stuff? I have no idea. Eddie peeked over the tank. The scientists were listening as one scientist spoke. The scientist speaking had spiky red hair and looked like he was in charge. I'm gonna try and get closer so that I can hear him. Eddie snuck us toward another tank, one nearly behind the spiky-haired scientist. And we couldn't have done this without all of your help. Now that the machine is fully functional, we can do what we intended. Start the zombie apocalypse. What? What are you doing, Eddie? They are going to find us. Eddie peeked over the tank again. The scientists were looking around, trying to find the source of the noise. You sure did it now, Eddie. Come on, we gotta get out of here. We looked up to see the lead scientist pointing a weapon at us. I could tell that Eddie was scared, so I started to take form. Then, the scientist fired the weapon, and we blacked out. On days 13 to 15, Eddie and I woke up, strapped down on a table. Hey, let me out. We looked around the room. There were cages, weird instruments, and glass windows looking in on us. Well, what are we gonna do, Venom? Hmm, I don't know. Oh, maybe escape? And with that, I sliced the belts that were tying us down so Eddie was able to get up. You could have gotten us out this whole time. Yes, it was just fun watching you squirm. Eddie sighed and walked to the door. He pulled it and it opened right up. Not very good security here, huh? He started to creep down the hall. Just then, the lead scientist came around the corner. We hid behind some boxes as he passed. He went back into the lab and we heard him yell. Who let my test subject out? We were still hiding behind the boxes. I did notice that he had a syringe in his hand with the same green stuff from the large room. We gotta get some more information out of him, Venom. Sure thing. I took my Venom form and we started to run toward the scientist. He screamed and ran into the room we were being held in. He sealed the door behind him and watched us through the glass. What? are you? We are Venom, and we know your plan, funny-haired man. The scientist scrambled around and pressed a big red button on the side of the wall. Something really loud started shrieking. Oh, turn it off! I could feel my Venom form fading away, and we turned back into regular Eddie. Eddie started to look woozy and collapsed on the floor. On days 16 to 19, we woke up strapped to the table. Again! Venom? What was that? Noise. I don't like loud noises. We had a terrible headache, and we could barely make out anything in the room. It was like our view was all fuzzy. When everything started to clear up, we saw the scientist again. He was standing on the other side of the room, looking at us through the glass. Extraordinary. I tried to cut the straps, but the scientist held up a device. If you change again, I'll turn on the alarm, and I'd rather keep you in one piece for now. I let Eddie take control. Who are you? Dr. Drake. I am researching life expansion, and I have finally reached a breakthrough. He pulled out the syringe with the green goo. In order for life to expand, it first needs to be controlled. It needs to have the best chance. So I started the zombie apocalypse. Survival of the fittest, you might say. Only the strongest should remain. Otherwise, the Earth's resources will be used up by the weak, and it's irreversible, so no chance of stopping me. He put the syringe away. He stepped up to a board and pressed some buttons. A huge device lowered down and looked like it was going to envelop us. What is that? Don't you worry. It will only hurt a little. My first test subject worked well, but apparently he was eaten? His tracker gave off information that it was swallowed. Sorry. But no matter, you're exactly what I need. I already have four attacks planned, but you are a welcome surprise. With you and the bombs, this city will be cleaned up in no time. The device lowered and was getting even closer to us. Um, I don't like this, Eddie. Me neither. The device started to get closer, and then I noticed something about it. There was a tube running really close to our hand. Maybe that could stop the machine. Hit it, Venom. I morphed out of Eddie's hand and pulled the tube. The whole device collapsed and smoke went up everywhere. Run! I took my Venom form and we were able to break the glass. I knocked over the scientist. He dropped his syringe and the small alarm device in the struggle. Pick those up! Okay! I grabbed them and we ran down the hallway. On days 20 to 22, we escaped. Barely. We ran down several hallways and finally broke through a window to get out. Wow, that was amazing. Amazing? We nearly died, Venom. Oh, we're fine. We climbed up the wall to the apartment and made our way inside. I let Eddie take form. He examined the device and the syringe. We need to tell people about this. Everyone is in danger. He started to move, but I didn't let him. Venom, come on. We gotta go warn everyone. But I'm hungry. Eddie sighed and started to go to the fridge. No, I want meat. Like that zombie. Oh, that was so gross. Maybe I can eat more zombies. Eddie stopped and thought for a minute. Venom, we need to help people first. If the worst comes to worst, we can eat the zombies, but we need to tell someone official. Okay, how about that Ann girl? I like her. Actually, that's a good idea. 
We might need some help, but then we talk to the authorities here in town. Okay. And he went to his phone and dialed Anne's number. While he was waiting, he tossed something on the ground. What's that? It's chocolate venom. It sounded gross. Symbiotes don't want chocolate, they want meat. And he picked up and ate the chocolate, and I felt myself get stronger. Ooh, yes, more of that. And he ate another, and another, and I felt myself growing. That's when I took my venom form once again, but this time I was even bigger. I felt stronger and had more hearts. My hunger meter grew too. Hello? I forgot that Anne was on the phone. Hello, this is Venom. Meet us at the small, messy place where we sleep. On days 23 to 26, we decided to make some upgrades to the apartment. I was helping build a secret door when Anne knocked on the door. I opened it up. Hello? Nobody was there. Wrong door, buddy. Oh, right. I went to the front door and there was Anne. I let Eddie take form. Hey, Anne, come in. He talked for a minute about boring things, and then I said something. Eddie, tell her about the zombies and all the ones I'm going to eat. Right, yes. Eddie told Anne about all the stuff we saw at the lab. He also told her about the safe house we were building. This is all great, Eddie. And Venom. I like her. Stop it. What? Nothing. You were saying? We need to go to the police. They can help us. We nodded and we went with Anne down to the police station. We told them about Dr. Drake and his plan to unleash the zombie apocalypse. They laughed and told us to go home. So we made our way back to the apartment. Rude. What about your boss, Eddie? You're a reporter. Maybe he will print a story about it. Eddie nodded his head and called his boss. He told him about the zombies and how everyone needed to be warned. Eddie, you really expect me to believe that? It's the truth. Look, I can't keep dealing with you and your crazy stories. You're fired, Eddie. Eddie sunk into the couch and sighed. Oh, I know what will cheer you up. Let's eat some chocolate. Eddie only sighed. <sighs> On days 27 to 31, Anne offered to help us build our safe house. We gathered more brick and stone from abandoned buildings and made the secret safe house look just like the rest of the building. We found some extra beds and other furniture, too. This looks great, Eddie. Uh, what about me? And Venom, too. I was really proud of our work. It was small, but maybe we could upgrade it in the future. Hey, Venom, we should build something else. Something that will let people know that this is a safe place to come when things get difficult. Eddie and I agreed that we want to build a statue of you. I was a little shocked. Eddie let me take form. Me? Why? Well, you saved my life. Life. And I know Eddie is really grateful that you saved him. Are you really grateful, Eddie? Yeah, yeah, sure. You're kind of our hero. Huh? Hero? I hadn't thought about that before, but it made sense. These humans were very frail and small. I was big and strong. Then I realized something. Am I the only one who can stop the zombies? And not it. We're counting on you, Venom. You're our only hope. That felt good. I liked that feeling. Okay, Anne? I will stop those zombies and make sure you puny humans don't die. Anne laughed. Sounds good to me. On days 32 to 35, Eddie and I went back to the lab, but I insisted on eating some more chocolate before we left. I would also make sure he stocked up on some more in our safe house, just in case. We knew Dr. Drake wanted to start the apocalypse. We just didn't know when or how. We needed to stay a few steps ahead of it if we could. On our way over, we didn't see anything out of the ordinary, except some interesting graffiti on the wall. What an odd thing to write. When we arrived, we could see the window we jumped out of. It was still broken. Should we go in through there again? I crawled up the side of the building to another window. I didn't see anything inside. The green tanks were empty, and there was no one in sight. That's not good. I climbed to the very top of the building to get a good view of the city. All of a sudden, I heard a loud boom, and a large plume of smoke went up in the air. Oh no, I think we're too late. We started to run across the buildings toward the large green cloud. As we got closer, we noticed that there was a lot of green goo everywhere. And there were zombies. They were running after normal humans and attacking them. We had to do something. All right, Venom, do your thing. I licked my lips and jumped down into the crowd. On days 36 to 39, I defeated and ate a lot of zombies. Maybe hundreds. I had never felt so full in my life. After eating one, I felt a surge of strength and I morphed into an even bigger Venom. I was even taller and my tongue got longer and I could use that as a new attack. I realized I couldn't keep eating because I was getting too full. So I started to fence off one city block so the zombies wouldn't get out. The humans were safe and I basically had an endless supply of food. Venom, we should go check on Anne. See if she's okay. Good idea, Annie. I like her. Me too, buddy. Me too. We made our way back to the apartment to check on Anne. I let Eddie take his human form since I was getting a little bit big for the ceilings. And We looked around and didn't see her anywhere. We checked the safe house. Maybe she went to get more chocolate. Venom, we have enough chocolate to last you a lifetime. Mm, mm, not possible. She wasn't in the safe house either. Where would she have gone? But then we heard another boom and there was an explosion just down the street. Eddie looked out the window. It was more green smoke. Oh no. It was time for me to take my Venom form again and we went racing outside to go help. On days 40 to 43, we found the explosion site. There was green goo everywhere, and people were turning into zombies again. We need to start fencing them in, just like the others. We started to take materials from the destroyed buildings and build a wall around the infected. Eventually, we got all of them inside. Eddie, there's Anne! I pointed to the top of a building nearby. She was looking around frantically. Anne! We raced up the side of the building and grabbed her. We ran her all the way back to the apartment building before letting her go. I let Eddie take form. What were you doing outside? I have some friends who live nearby and I was in their building when I heard the explosion. I went to the roof of the building, hoping it would be a safe place. My friends went downstairs. I don't think they made it. I'm so sorry, Anne, but I'm glad you're safe. We are glad you're safe. Just please, don't go outside again. She nodded, but she looked pretty sad. Hey. 
Venom will take care of us, okay? I'll let my true Venom form come out. Of course I will. Who do you think I am? That made Anne laugh, and she tried to embrace me. What a funny human. Thank you. What can I do to help? I let Eddie take control again. There must be a pattern to the attacks. He mentioned that he had planned four. We need a map so we can figure out where Dr. Drake is going to strike next. Anne nodded and pulled out a map from the bookshelf. We looked at the areas of the city, and it didn't look like much yet. We'll have to wait and see. Okay, how about we work on that statue, so people know where to go? Great idea. We started to build the statue on top of the safe house. We only got the first little bit done, but I'm excited to see how it turns out. On days 44 to 49, we went back outside to scout the city. At this point, most people knew to stay inside. Some still went about their business, though, like nothing was happening. Eddie said that the mayor told everyone that everything was under control and they had nothing to worry about. I felt so proud of myself, but also worried. There were so many people in the city. People like Anne and Eddie. I really liked them, and I didn't want people like them to turn into zombies. It wasn't fair of Dr. Drake to decide who would live in his weird world. He needed to be stopped at all costs. Eddie, where do you think Dr. Drake is? Well, if he wants to stop the zombie apocalypse, he's probably hiding in a safe house like ours, but probably with more security and food. Do you think he has a chocolate stash? Bet he does, buddy. That made me like him even less. How dare he take chocolate that should be mine? We jumped around on some buildings to look around, but there didn't seem to be anything. There is always an explosion of goop, so he must put it there before it goes off. Did you see any sort of container at the other sites? I don't know. Let's go see. I need a snack anyway. We headed over to the second explosion site where we had built the zombie fence. I noticed there was some sort of weird shaped thing on the ground. What is that? We picked it up but we couldn't tell what it was. Maybe a bolt or something? We took it with us back to the apartment. On days 50 to 53, we found Anne in the apartment with a few other people. I let Eddie take his human so we wouldn't scare everyone. These people live downstairs, but they said the owner of this building disappeared. They didn't feel safe in their apartment, so they came up here. The owner is gone? Well, what if we just retrofitted the entire apartment to be a safe house? That way you can still live in your home. That would be perfect, thank you. I'm Anita, by the way. Let me know if you need any help with anything. Of course, we could use some help with securing the block. Anita nodded and started to gather some people to help her outside. Anne, Eddie, and I got to work building some new security measures for the surrounding buildings. We cleared out some of the other debris from the broken buildings and made ourselves a large wall surrounding us. We also started to work more on the statue. It was starting to look really good. It felt good to know that we were protecting people. Thanks again for taking us in. You're amazing. Of course. Anything we can do to help. Anita nodded, and her and her friends went back downstairs. Once we were done, Anne, Eddie, and I sat around the safe house table, looking at the weird object we had found. We had put it in a container and didn't let Anne touch it, just in case. Wait, I know what that is. It's the top of a fire hydrant. Are you kidding? Those are everywhere. How are we supposed to know which one is real and which one is a trap? But our conversation was interrupted when we heard a loud explosion. It didn't seem as close this time, but it still made me mad. How dare Dr. Drake hurt all these people? Eddie let me take the venom form, and we went sprinting toward the green plume of smoke. On days 54 to 57, we arrived at a city block close to the waterfront. People were groaning and already turning into zombies. There weren't as many zombies this time, but it still made me mad. Hey, Venom. Are you okay? No! Why would a fellow human hurt other humans? There are a lot of good humans here. Some are bad and should be eaten, but mostly they are good like you and Anne. Drake needs to be stopped. You're starting to sound like a human. That's good. At first I thought you were just this parasite that was going to eat me and everyone here. You're actually better than most people I know. That made me feel only a little bit better. Well, actually it made me feel pretty good. It was nice to feel needed. Venom, are you crying? No, we are crying. It's okay, buddy. It's all good. We saw an emergency flare go up in the sky. Hey, that's a flare from our emergency stash. The people in our building must be in trouble. We ran toward the source of the explosion to see what was going on. On days 58 to 62, we arrived back at the apartment. Everything seemed normal, and nobody seemed to know who shot off the flare. But then, Anita came running up to us. Eddie, you won't believe it. Anne is a traitor. What? She was acting really weird, so I followed her up onto the roof. She told me that she was a spy for Dr. Drake and had staked out the apartment for him. She's been trying to get to you so she can turn you into Drake. I couldn't believe it. Anne was our friend. How could she betray us like this? Where did she go? I don't know. She must have gone down the fire escape. I tried to grab her, but she let off the flare, and it scared me so bad that I fell over. I think she was telling Drake where we are. Everyone started to freak out. Hey, everyone, calm down. We will take care of this. Don't worry. Anita seemed really shaken. I felt the same way. I still couldn't believe that Anne was gone, plotting with Dr. Drake. She was probably in on it the whole time. She pretended to be attacked by a zombie so someone would help her. Drake wanted test subjects, but now he just wanted me. He would do anything to get to me. I felt so angry at him, but I also felt sad about Anne. I liked her. Me too, buddy. Me too. We decided to keep lookout for the night. I also checked all the fire hydrants in our block. They all seemed real, so I felt good about our safety. I still felt sad, but I knew that I needed to protect our friends. If Drake was coming, I'd be there to meet him. On day 63 to 66, Dr. Drake didn't come. We were expecting him to, but he never did. We waited and waited. Everyone seemed on edge, Eddie most of all. Why hasn't he come yet? 
What is he waiting for? I didn't know, but I had a weird feeling about this whole situation. Or maybe it was hunger. I couldn't tell. Venom, what should we do? Eat chocolate. I'm serious. So am I. And he threw up his hands in frustration. Eddie, I know this must be hard for you too. He nodded. Are you crying? No. We are crying. On days 67 to 70, we went into the safe house to rustle up some chocolate. Well in there, we noticed the map that Anne had taken out. She had plotted the attack sites in red marker. Venom, look at that. I know, Eddie. I see through your eyes. The three points were marked equal distance from each other. Then Anne had plotted the next spot with a bright yellow marker. Anne figured it out. Wait, why would she plot this out if she was a traitor? Maybe she left it here on accident? She already knew where the attack points were. No, Anne is smarter than that. Then it dawned on us. Anita! She must be the traitor. But if that's the case, where's Anne? We decided to go up to the roof to investigate. Anita must have been wanting to contact Drake, and Anne was onto her. Anne followed her up here with the flare gun as a precaution, and she confronted Anita. Anita is not good people. No, she's not, buddy. Anne must have set off the flare, and Anita had to come up with a story to keep her cover. So, where's Anne? Anita must be hiding her. Then we heard some noise coming from the rooftop storage closet. We took on my venom form and approached the door. I opened it, my claws bared, ready to fight. Anne! On day 71 to 74, we untied Anne and helped her out of the storage closet. I'm so happy you found me. But Eddie, Venom, we need to stop Anita. She's a traitor. We know. We saw your map. You are the smartest human and wouldn't leave that if you were a traitor. You're not too bad yourself, Venom. I let Eddie take his form again. And Eddie, of course. Well, we are Venom. So I just assume everything good you have to say applies to me too. Well, I'm glad you found me. Anita was on the phone with Drake when I grabbed her. I managed to get her phone and throw it off the building before shooting the flare gun. Well, nothing has happened, so Anita must not have contacted Drake yet. We need to make sure she doesn't. Otherwise, lots of people will be in danger. We headed downstairs to Anita's apartment. When she opened the door, she looked terrified. Anita, we need to talk to you. She tried to run inside and shut the door, but Eddie let the venom form come out and we rushed inside. Anita, you heard Anne! I didn't have a choice. Drake has my family. Wait, what? Drake somehow found where you lived, and he knew I lived in the same building. So he's been using me to get information about the safe house. And you... What have you told him? Nothing. Anne threw my phone off the building before I had a chance to say anything. I couldn't get a new one because the city is basically on lockdown. Please, he probably thinks I've betrayed him. He has my family. She started to cry. Eddie wanted to take his human form again, but I wanted to talk to her some more. We will get your family back, Anita. They are important to you, so they are important to us. I patted her on the back. Do you know where he keeps his chocolate? What? Sorry, do you know where his safe house is? No. But we know where he is attacking next. Do you know when that will be? All he said is that he needed to wait. He had to make some modifications or something. We sat and thought for a bit, but we had no idea what Drake could be planning. We decided to help Anita get a new phone so she could contact Drake. She told him that she needed some more time since we were making more improvements to the block. He seemed to buy it. For now. That should stall him for a bit, but we will find your family, Anita. We promise. On day 75 to 78, Anita apologized to Anne and they started working together again. Anita helped us to finish the statue as well. We thought it looked pretty awesome and hoped that it would be a beacon of hope for people. We also crafted some weapons and gear for the people in the block. We had no idea what was coming, but we wanted to be prepared. Everyone seemed a little happier and hopeful. We welcomed more people into our safe perimeter and they even gave me chocolate as a gift. Wow, we will never run out of chocolate. We also went around the city to check on the zombie corals where they are fenced in. People need to be able to get to their homes and shops. We got to work making a large zombie pen on a small island just by a pier. We slowly started transporting the zombies over there. We also cleaned up the and help the people living nearby. It was good to be a hero. On day 79 to 84, we scouted the block where the next explosion should be. We checked all the fire hydrants and they all seemed normal. Weird. Maybe he hasn't put it in here yet. We took shelter on a nearby roof and staked out the block. A lot of time passed and nothing happened. What in the world? I was starting to get suspicious. We knew where he was going to be. Why wasn't he here? It didn't make sense. Wait, Anita said he was making modifications. What if it's not a fire hydrant? What if it's... I saw it. I hurried and ran down the building toward the car. It was green, just like the goo. But before I could reach it, the car exploded. On days 85 to 89, a giant explosion made the block rumble. The buildings were damaged and there was a large crater full of green goo. There weren't any people outside, so there weren't any zombies to worry about. But we needed to clean up this goo before it would start to infect people. I guess that Drake just wanted a bigger explosion this time. We managed to clean up all of the goo before checking out the pieces of the car but there was hardly anything left, just a crater. Wait, look! There was a very small trail of green goo leading away from the explosion site. Maybe the car was driven here. It left a trail. Great job, Venom. We followed the trail, cleaning it up as we went. It led out to a pier and then stopped. Do cars drive on water? No, they don't, buddy. He must have taken a boat. We looked around but didn't see any more signs of green goo. The boat could have come from anywhere. We will find him, Eddie. We will find Dr. Drake and make sure he doesn't blow up anything else. I know. 
It'll just take a little more time. On days 90 to 94, we went back to the safe house to regroup and look at the map. And pointed out a few different islands that were nearby, as well as the prison. I doubt he would be at the prison, but he might be on this island. It has some abandoned buildings there. It looked like our best bet, but we wanted to prep and make sure we had everything we needed before heading over there. Eddie grabbed the syringe we had taken, as well as some chocolate bars. Oh yes, those are most important. We also helped people find apartments to stay in. I let Eddie take his human form to talk to everyone. Thank you for all your support and help. We think we have found where Dr. Drake is staying, and we're going to make sure all of this ends soon. We will restore the city and make sure nothing like this happens again. People clapped and cheered. Then one called out my name. Venom, you're our hero, Venom! And the crowd started chanting my name. Eddie let me take my Venom form, and the crowd cheered even louder. We are Venom! On days 95 to 97, we said goodbye to Anne. Are you sure you'll be okay? Do you want me to come with you? We'll be fine, but we can't risk anyone else coming. No one is immune like us. Anne nodded, but she looked sad. Hey, we'll be okay. We promise. She nodded her head and looked down, but then Eddie gave her a hug. You take care of each other, okay, Venom? I took my Venom form and told her, yes, we will take care. I gave Anne a grin, and then we took off. It was time to stop that scientist. On day 98, we headed for the island. We swam under the pier and made our way across the muddy terrain. It was foggy, but we managed to muddle our way to what looked like an old hospital. It had some large graffiti on the side of the building. Creepy. You got that right. We found an open window and leapt through, trying not to make much sound. It seemed quiet. Wait, listen. It sounded like someone was yelling upstairs somewhere. We made our way through the corridors and up the stairs. The noise was getting louder, so we knew we were in the right place. We opened the door and saw a long hallway with rooms on both sides. But then, a bunch of zombies came running out from around the corner. I started fighting the zombies and managed to take a few down. Other zombies tried to attack me, but it hardly did anything. After only a few moments, all the zombies were gone. I'll bet there's more coming. I hope so. I was enjoying the fighting. We continued down the hallway and saw some double doors leading into a large open room. There were tanks filled with green goo and Dr. Drake standing in the middle of them. He didn't seem to notice us, so we ducked behind a tank. He looked like he was experimenting on some people. We looked around again and noticed there were cells with people inside. And his family must be in here somewhere. We will free them, Eddie, but first, we need to deal with Drake. Agreed. We crept forward and managed to leap toward Drake. Before we knew it, he had pressed a button and some alarm started blaring. Turn it off! Oh, look who it is. It's Venom, the hero. Dr. Drake turned off the alarm for a moment. I felt so weak, so I let Eddie take his human form. Not so strong without your parasite, are you, Mr. Brock? Let these people go, Drake. Drake hit Eddie and laughed. No, you see, everything is going very well. I realized I couldn't infect you. So the most I could do was kill you. Turns out the exploding car didn't quite do it. That was the modification that Anita was talking about. No matter. I don't need you anymore. You're just a liability now. Soon, I'll be able to open your little compound and infect all the people there. I have someone on the inside. No, you don't. Anita told us everything. She isn't going to help you. Drake yelled and hit Eddie again. She will, if I tell her that her family is going to die if she doesn't. Drake pointed to some people in a cell nearby. They were trembling and looked so scared. I needed to help them. I thought of Anne, Anita, and especially Eddie. They all needed me, and I couldn't let them down. I mustered all my strength and took my final form. No! I transformed into the biggest possible version of Venom. I was huge, with tons of heart, and I could feel I was stronger than ever. On day 99, I charged towards Drake, but he had one last trick up his sleeve. He ran back into an emergency pod and sealed the door shut. It started to rumble and I thought he might have an ejection pod. But to my surprise, the rumbling stopped. I saw now that the door he was sealed behind was only part of a much larger door. The large door slid open, and a gigantic robot walked out, piloted by Dr. Drake. The fight was on. Dr. Drake and I started to fight, and it was a good thing I had gained all those extra hearts because he started to take them away quickly. I was strong, but his robot suit was so powerful, I worried I wouldn't be able to defeat him before he took away all of my life. But then I saw something strange in the room he had come out of, a glowing device of some kind. I couldn't get past him, though. The huge robot suit was blocking the only entrance into the room, and he refused to move away from it far enough to let me pass. But then I had an idea. Your turn, Eddie. I changed my form back to the human, and much smaller Eddie. Eddie knew what to do and ran right under the robot's leg into the room. I saw now that the glowing machine was the source of the robot's power. No, don't touch that. I turned back into Venom. Sorry, Drake. Looks like your robot suit's time has expired. I broke the machine and heard Dr. Drake scream as his robot suit exploded. I saw the doctor standing in the scraps of his robot suit. I cornered him and then pulled out the syringe that Eddie had stolen from the lab all those days ago. Have a taste of your own medicine, doctor. I plunged the syringe into Drake and he started to scream. He backed up and began to change. His skin turned green as his cries turned into moans. Soon, he was a zombie, but still with that trademark red hair, of course. I licked my lips. Snack time! Soon, I was enjoying another zombie meat treat. Everyone in the cages clapped and cheered me on. 
we let them out, and I went searching for my well-earned chocolate stash before heading home. On day 100, we made it back to the apartment, safe and sound. Anita reunited with her family, and we saw Anne again. She made us the biggest chocolate cake ever, which was followed by an even bigger hub. Ed even got his job as a reporter back. We helped clean up the entire city, the green goo tanks, and everything went back to the way it was. Better even. If you want to know what adventure we go on next, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for your support. I already survived 100 days as Venom, defeating the evil Dr. Drake and shutting down his plan to turn everyone into zombies. But now the challenge was to survive another 100 days as Eddie Brock and Venom. On day 101, Eddie was called by his boss to travel to another city nearby to cover a story about a killer on the loose. Sounds creepy. We should go. We told Anne and she wanted to come with us. No, Anne. It'll be too dangerous. I'm coming. She stared Eddie down, but he just stared her down right back. Finally, he threw his hands into the air. Fine. She jumped up and down for joy, then gave Eddie a kiss on the cheek. His face got all red. What's wrong with your face, Eddie? Nothing. We gathered some supplies. Eddie grabbed his camera, and grabbed some flares, and I grabbed some chocolate before heading out. We all took one last look at the statue. It's okay, Eddie. Venom will protect us if anything goes wrong. We'll be fine. We all took off on his motorcycle and made our way to the city. We drove through towns and something called a forest. It was pretty cool, but I thought the trees looked funny. We finally made it to the edge of the city where a bridge stood. It seemed to be blocked off and there was graffiti everywhere. Weird. We looked around when all of a sudden some crooks popped out. Their leader was wearing a suit and held a weapon which seemed to glow. I morphed into my venom form and started to snack on the crooks. Ugh, what is that? The leader pointed his weapon at me and it shot electricity. Ouch! The force knocked us back off the bridge, then everything went dark. On day 102, we woke up under the bridge. I felt so weak and Eddie seemed pretty banged up. We managed to pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off, but then I realized my hearts were down to just three again. What in the world? I tried to take form, and I was the same size as before, just with less hearts. That weapon had quite the kick to it. You got that right, buddy. We looked around and didn't see the bike or... Anne! We looked around frantically, but couldn't see her anywhere. Venom, we need to find her. We went deeper into the city. It seemed abandoned, and some of the buildings even seemed like they had been blown up. Ah. We saw a kid down an alleyway. He screamed and then he ran into a store. Hey, we won't hurt you. I let Eddie take form and he ran over to the door. A woman was locking the door. No, please. We've been robbed and our friend has been kidnapped. She looked at us and then unlocked the door. She offered us some food and we told her about Anne. She said that she saw a woman being dragged away by some crooks a few hours before. That must have been her. Where were they taking her? Probably to Cletus Cassidy. He is basically running the whole city now. Those crooks work for him. This was really bad. Eddie was supposed to work on a story on Cletus, and now he had Anne. It's okay, Eddie. We will find Anne. I promise. The nice lady, whose name we learned was Julie, and her son, Chris, gave us some food and new clothes. Now we just needed a safe place to stay. On day 103, we went sneaking through the city to find a safe place to stay. We found an abandoned building that looked like it used to be a factory. This will do. We took some materials from some rubble to make some improvements. We patched up some walls and even made a secret door to get in. Not half bad. All of a sudden, we heard a loud crash outside. We peeked out the window and saw some crooks trying to break into a restaurant across the street. They were different from the ones we saw on day 101 and had regular weapons instead of the ones that shot lightning. We ran outside to help. I'd leave that alone if I were you. The crooks turned around, brandishing their knives. Eddie let me morph and we attacked. Within no time, the crooks were gone and in my stomach. Good thing, I was getting hungry. I felt myself grow and my heart's increased. Nice, looks like I can get my health back and I'm taller now. Good thing we live in a place with high ceilings. We headed back to the factory to get settled in for the night. We also took a little bit of time to make Eddie his own room. Then before bed, we made a nice little corner for Anne. We'll find you, Anne. We promise. On days 104 to 105, we went out to gather more supplies for the factory. We didn't know how many people were still in the city, but we decided that the factory would be a good refuge for people. We were out looking for some sort of food when we saw the crooks from day one. I took Venom form. Give us Anne back! We charged at them, and they screamed in terror. We ate all of them except one. We held them down. Tell us where you took Anne! I don't know, man. We just drop off the cargo at the abandoned bakery. But nobody stays there. They must have taken her somewhere else. All of a sudden, he slashed me with a knife, dealing a good amount of damage. He started to run away. 
I hurried and grabbed him, eating him before he could get any farther. Venom. I know, Eddie. We need to get to that bakery. On days 106 to 108, we stopped at the factory before heading over to the bakery. We had taken the knives from the crooks, so we had extra weapons, but we grabbed a crowbar and some other things, just in case. A crowbar? I think we're gonna need some stronger weapons. Why do we need weapons when we have me, a super-powered symbiote? Well, you haven't been all that much help, Venom. You let him get away with Anne. Huh? Eddie was mad? At me? I wasn't the one who took Anne. I morphed my arm out and punched Eddie in the face. Ouch! What was that for? Stop being silly, Eddie. We will find Anne, so stop feeling sorry for yourself. Eddie rubbed at his now black eye. He seemed really angry, but then he sighed and nodded. You're right. Let's go kick some booty. On days 109 to 110, we snuck to the bakery. It was a fairly small city, so it wasn't too hard to find. There were a few guys outside, but they wouldn't be too hard to fight. We started toward the building when we saw a car pull up and a teenager get pushed out. Then a guy jumped out. He had crazy hair and a bright red suit on. He ushered the teenager into the bakery and started talking to the guys at the front. That must be Cletus Cassidy. I recognize him from the photos I've seen in the papers. He must have Anne. I took form and charged at him. He looked startled, but then his crooks started attacking me. I managed to dodge most of their attacks pretty well, which made the crooks nervous. I dealt with the crooks and went to corner Cletus. I saw the teen run out from the building, but then Cletus pulled out a sword and slashed at me. Ouch! It actually hurt and I took some damage. Part of my form detached as Cletus kept slashing at me. Venom, he's hurting you. We need to go. We ran away, part of my form still wiggling away on the pavement as we rounded a corner. I needed time to heal. I let Eddie take form. Hey. We saw the teenager from the car come down the opposite alleyway. Thanks for distracting them. I was able to get away. For sure, kid. What's your name? Zach. My whole family is gone. Can I stay with you? We led him back to the factory and set up a bed for him to sleep. We didn't find Anne, but we did save a kid. That felt good. On days 111 to 112, we made a nice little room for Zack. He really liked it and offered to help us find food. I've been living on the streets for a few years, and I know what places dump out good food. We'll have a feast in no time. We followed him to some dumpsters, and sure enough, there was lots of leftovers. Yes. We even found some chocolate. Why would anyone throw this away? We made some storage bins to put the food in, as well as a small kitchen. It wasn't amazing, but it was good enough for now. Hey, thanks, Zach. We couldn't have done this without you. No problem, man. There are a lot of people out there who need a safe place more than ever. I'm just glad you and, uh, the black gooey thing... Venom. Venom are here. The city needs a hero. I didn't really feel like it, but I would try my best. On days 113 to 115, Zack told me a little bit more about Cletus Cassidy. Cletus was sent to jail after committing crimes that killed a bunch of people. He was scheduled to be transferred to a more secure prison, but on the way, there was an accident, and he escaped from the truck. He's been on the loose ever since. So where did all the crooks come from? Cletus has been friends with a mob boss named Derek Nim for years. When Cletus busted out, he went to Nim and they made a deal about taking over the city. Nim gets to proceed with business, and if anyone crosses him, he takes them to Cletus. So why is Cletus in charge and not Nim? People are way more scared of Cletus. Nim is just a suit. Cletus is actually, well, crazy. Makes sense. This all seemed like too much to handle. A mob boss and a murderer? I was way in over my head. On days 116 to 119, Zack and I saw an emergency flare go up in the sky. What in the world? Then we remembered. And grabbed flares before heading to the city. That must be her. We told Zack to go back to the factory and took off toward the flare and saw Anne on top of a building. She was with another girl with bright blue hair. Eddie! She waved her hands at us and we ran up to her. I was about to let Eddie take form when Anne yelled at me. We don't have time. We need to go now. Venom! I grabbed her and carried her down, going back up for the other girl right after. When I put both of them down, I led them back to the factory before I finally let Eddie take form and he led them inside through the secret door. He hugged Dan. I'm so glad you found us. Tell me what happened. Anne told us how the crooks had taken her somewhere, but she had no idea where she was because she was blindfolded. After a few days, they brought another girl. Anne could hear her crying occasionally. The crooks kept them prisoner, occasionally feeding them. She heard them talking about not giving them over to Cletus because they wanted the girls to join Nim's mob. How did you escape? The crooks untied us and were about to take us to Nim instead, but I managed to escape with the other girl and grab a flare in the process. We ran to the top of the building, hoping you would see. We looked at the other girl. She still looked scared out of her mind. What's your name? 
Maggie, are you a monster like Cletus? No, we don't hurt people. Well, Venom eats people, but only the crooks. Maggie looks confused. So the black monster that morphs out of you is not related to the red monster that morphs out of Cletus? Now it was my turn to be confused. Red monster? Maggie nodded. There is a red monster that morphs out of Cletus. I saw it before I was captured. How is that possible? Venom? It must have been when Cletus was slashing at me. Part of my form detached and must have attached to Cletus. But he's a red symbiote. Is that bad? It's very bad. On days 120 to 122, we made some more improvements to the factory. Anne really liked the room we made for her, and even gave Eddie a kiss on the cheek again. He seemed really happy to have her back. I was too. We went to our room to gather some things when Eddie started talking to me. Hey Venom, sorry for getting mad at you earlier. I know it must have been hard for you without all your strength. You did the best you could. I felt really happy he had said that. Then I felt our eyes leaking. <laughs> it's okay to cry, buddy. I didn't realize it until now, but I was having a hard time. I wasn't nearly as strong as I was before, and I felt really upset I couldn't help more people. I used to be able to do everything. Now I felt a little useless. On days 123 to 126, we went out in the city to see if there were any more people that needed help. Most seemed to stay inside, but we thought we would check, just in case. We were going down an alleyway when we heard someone running behind us. We turned around to see a little kid. Please, mister, can you help us? He grabbed Eddie's hand and dragged him into a rundown apartment complex. There's some bad men trying to get into the house. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. We entered the dimly lit hall and went up the stairs. Sure enough, there was a group of crooks trying to break down the door. Hey, get away from there. The crooks looked at Eddie and sneered. What are you gonna do, tough guy? Eddie smiled, then let me take form. The crooks screamed as we charged. They got a few hits in, but we were able to easily defeat them. Yeah, take that! Then I felt a surge of power and I grew in size. I even gained some of my hearts back. I didn't feel so down on myself. I knew I would get my strength back. It would just take time. Are they gone? The little boy creeped up the stairs. I let Eddie take form. They're gone. You're safe to go inside. The kid knocked on the door and yelled for his mom. She opened the door and hugged her son. Thank you. Of course. If you want somewhere safer to stay, we have some room. The mother shook her head. I would, but my husband needs to stay here. He's very sick and all his medicine and machines are here. I understand. Let me at least help you here. We made a few improvements to the apartment so that it was safer for the little family. If you've liked what you've seen so far, you should subscribe. We love having you here on this journey with us. We made our way back to the factory feeling a little bit better about ourselves. On days 127 to 131, I heard a knock on my door. It was Maggie. I let her in. Hey Eddie, can I talk to you? Yeah, sure. What's up? I wanted to talk to you about Cletus. I think I know what could stop him. Really? Yeah. Before I was captured, I saw Cletus transform. But I also saw Nim use an electric weapon on someone, and Cletus freaked out. Why? He was partially in the way, and it hit him. It wasn't that bad, but he screamed and threatened to hurt Nim if he used it again. Sounds like he doesn't like electricity. Wait. What? I think he used that lightning weapon on us when I got into the city. It took out nearly all of Venom's health and threw us into a brick wall. Ouch. Tell me about it. We need to find that lightning weapon. He said he was going to keep it just in case. I don't think he'd keep it on him, but maybe close by. It wasn't a lot to go on, but it was something. On days 132 to 135, I decided to scout the city to see where Cletus was hiding. I went back to the shop where Julie and Chris were. I asked about the electric weapon to see if they knew anything. Chris piped up. Its name is Bolt. Nim used to use it all the time before Cletus came into town, but not anymore. Word is that it can turn your bones to dust. Julie looked concerned that he knew all this information, but it was really helpful. Do you know where it could be? Well, I heard that Cletus took it and has it stashed somewhere safe. Or is it in a safe? I don't know, but my friend used the word safe. A safe? Interesting, but also a little discouraging. We were in a city after all. There had to be thousands of safes. Then out of nowhere, the door blew off its hinges and a bunch of crooks were waiting outside. Eddie let me take form and I tried to shield Julie and Chris while they ran back into the room for cover. Well, 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 if it isn't my least favorite symbiote. I looked and saw Cletus, but then almost immediately, he turned into a large red version of, well, me. This is not good, Eddie. What is that? 
We are carnage, and we are in charge here. His crooks attacked me, but I was able to deal with them quickly. Carnage charged me, and he immediately got some hits in. He took me down to half of my health. Eddie! I saw Julie holding a rifle, and she started to shoot Carnage. He screamed in pain while we ran into the back of the store. Chris threw a smoke bomb, giving us a little bit of cover. We have an underground passage. Come on! We moved past the shelves together. I heard someone open a trap door, and we all dropped down into the sewer. The door closed, and we rushed away. We continued on for a little while until we reached a ladder up to the street. That was impressive. You never know who will come into the shop. You just have to be prepared. I'm sorry about your shop, but you should come and live with us. We can set up a shop there, and you can be safe. They happily agreed, and we made our way to the factory. On days 136 to 139, Julie and Chris moved into the factory. We set them up with some nice rooms and then worked on making them a little shop in the downstairs area. It was bigger, but didn't have nearly as much food in it. Zach was nice enough to find some for them, as well as some other things to sell. I know it's not exactly the same, but it's something for now. Then I got an idea. I told Julie and the others about a statue we could build to let people know that there was food and shelter here. We discussed it, and they agreed it was a great idea. We started gathering materials and went to work. Can you guess what it might be? Also, if you like what you see so far, be sure to like and subscribe. We would love for you to watch our next adventure. On days 140 to 143, Ann and Eddie chatted for a while about what our next move should be. Well, we need to find the safe that bolt is hidden in. I wonder how we can find a safe in a big city like this. Someone must have heard something. I should go out and have a look. You mean we? No. You got kidnapped once and I couldn't protect you. Who knows what'll happen if you go out there again? Eddie, I'm not going to live my life in fear because I was kidnapped once. I'm going with you. Have I told you how much I like Anne? Yes, you have. We all gathered some supplies and headed out to go look for a safe. On days 144 to 149, Ann and Eddie snuck around the city to see if we could gather more information on Bolt. We ran into a few people who were trying their best to hide. We invited some of them back to the base for safety. Some agreed, but some wanted to stay where they were. However, nobody seemed to know anything about the lightning weapon. This is getting to be a little hopeless. Somebody has to know something. Then, out of nowhere, a group of crooks came around the corner. We hid and listened to them talking. Yeah, but the boss doesn't have Bolt anymore, remember? Yeah, yeah, sure. The big boss man Cletus took it. I saw him go into the central tower with a big briefcase. The entire building is abandoned, except the top floor. That's where his safe house is. This was great information. Good thing I didn't eat those guys. We need to head to that tower. I nodded and we headed in that direction. We did our best to sneak past all the crooks on the way and managed to make it to the tower. It was a lot bigger than I had imagined. We should scale the side. You sure you want Venom to do that? Yes, it'll be the fastest. I morphed and then grabbed Anne as we scaled the side of the building. It was a long way up, but Anne didn't seem to mind. I managed to break through a window near the top and we all climbed through. I don't see anybody. Do you? Nope. We snuck around and sure enough, it seemed deserted. We entered a large room and saw a few crooks beating up a guy in the corner. Hey, you leave him alone! We charged and smacked the guys left and right. They didn't have any special weapons on them, so it was really easy to defeat them. Thank you. The guy that was beaten up didn't look so good and rushed over to him. We should get you some help. No, I'm fine. The guy tried to stand up on his own, but he immediately fell over. Yeah, sure you are. We escorted him to the hole we climbed in from. Anne helped him get on my back, and I carried him down to the street. I climbed up to carry Anne down as well, and we helped him get back to the factory with us. Once we were safe back at the factory, we checked on his wounds and got to planning out a room for him to stay in. I hope you'll be okay. I'm sure he will. I wonder why the building was basically empty, though. Those crooks said that was Cletus's hiding spot. It was. Huh? Oh. The guy groaned. I've been sleeping behind the dumpster near the tower. I saw them all moving stuff out, so I figured it was safer than the street. Apparently not. We wanted to get him to rest as soon as possible. On days 150 to 153, we built a room for the guy. We knew he would be recovering for a while, so we wanted him to be as comfortable as possible. I'm Travis, by the way. We are Venom! I guess Gletus is like us, but he is not necessarily a nice symbiote. Yeah, I've seen him. He's pretty freaky. And strong. We'll get him, Travis. We have a plan. You do? Sort of. If the bolt wasn't in the tower, then it must be in a safe somewhere in the city. We got some information from a friend. A safe? Yeah, it's not a lot, but it's something. Well, best of luck to you, my friend. I'm in no condition to help with that, but I am happy to help around here. Everyone was put to work. 
Zach gathered the food, Travis worked on food prep, and Julie and Chris worked on stocking the store. Maggie and Ann welcomed new people in and set up areas for them to stay. It felt good to help. On days 154 to 157, we woke up Maggie pounding on our door. Come quick, Eddie. We followed her and we found everyone gathered around Zach. He didn't look too good. Uh -oh. Zach, what happened? I went to gather some food this morning, but some other guys beat me up to get to it first. I guess one of them had a knife. Sure enough, Zach had a bad cut on his leg. This needs stronger medicine than we have right now. We'll go find some. There's a pharmacy in the abandoned grocery store about a mile away. I have a friend who crashes there sometimes. He might be able to help out, unless he got kicked out. We'll go look, buddy. You sit tight for now. Eddie and I snuck over to the grocery store on the lookout for anything suspicious. We entered the front door and the lights flickered. This is creepy. You are probably one of the creepiest things I've ever seen in my life. And you think a couple of lights flickering is creepy? Don't judge me. We continued back toward the pharmacy. The lights continued to flicker and there was food all over the ground. What a mess. We made it back to the pharmacy, but it looked like it was locked. Go on, pick the lock. I reached out to try, but before I could, the door swung open, revealing a hobo. What you doing here? Zach sent us. He got attacked by a couple of guys and has a pretty nasty cut. He needs medicine. The guy nodded and closed the door. After a minute, he brought out some medicine and gauze. This should work. Tell Zach to take care. We offered to let him stay at the factory, but he said he was happy where he was. We made our way back to Zach with the medicine. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Of course. We can't have you risking your life for all of us to get food. Tell us where to go, and we can go instead. He reluctantly agreed, and we went out to gather some more food for our friends. On days 158 to 162, we worked to gather some food nearby and even invited a few more people back to the base. It looks like we need to expand. We worked on making some improvements and also worked on the statue for a little while. It was starting to come together. Hopefully, we could let everyone in the city know that they weren't alone. It was looking pretty good when all of a sudden we heard a loud bang. We hurried and ran down to the factory to see that it was on fire. Oh no! Eddie and I ran in and tried to gather all of our friends. They seemed fine, all except for Maggie. She coughed violently. Eddie, you need to stop Nim. Don't worry about that now, Maggie. We need to get you some help. No, you don't understand. <coughs> it was Nim that set the fire. I saw him outside the window and I tried to grab him, but he threw the explosive device in my room. I couldn't stop the fire. <coughs> she coughed again. She held out her hand. There was a key inside. I grabbed this from around his neck in the struggle. It might help you beat Cletus. She coughed again and then slumped over. She's gone. We all mourned our friend as the factory burned up around us. Eddie looked at the key. Huh? There seemed to be an address on it. Venom. I morphed and bared my teeth. We are Venom and we are going to avenge our friend. On days 163 to 166, I ran full speed to the address on the key. There was nothing, just a construction site. This can't be right, there's nothing here. We punched a building nearby and everything trembled. Then we saw a piece of rubble fall off the building. It looked like it was going to fall on a stack of crates, but then it disappeared. What in the world? We inched forward to the crates and saw a hole leading into the ground. This must be it. Yes. We started climbing down the ladder into a dark area. There was a light up ahead in the tunnel. We slowly crept toward it and realized that it was a subway station. Wow. There was an abandoned subway car sitting among some beams. What did I tell you, Nim? Stay away from the symbiote. I was going to take care of him myself. We saw Cletus in front of the car. He continued yelling. Seems like Nim's plan wasn't approved by Cletus. I don't care. Cletus is involved, so he is just as guilty of hurting Maggie as Nim is. I was about to charge forward when Eddie held us back. No, look. We saw Nim on the other side of the tunnel with a bunch of his crooks. Cletus looked very angry. What are you doing here? Nobody's supposed to know about this place. You think I'm a fool, Cletus? I found out about this place a long time ago. I'm sick of taking orders from you. I'm taking Bolt back, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. Bolt is here. We need to get it before Nim does. Just wait a minute. Cletus began to form into carnage, and then Nim's guys began to shoot him. He screamed and attacked the crooks. While he was distracted, Nim ran to the subway car. He went to grab something from around his neck, then looked around in horror. Fall back! I don't have the key! He ran away, leaving his crooks to get eaten by carnage. Well, that was unexpected. Come on, let's go while he's distracted. We snuck around and went to the other side of the subway car. We took out the key, and sure enough, it opened the subway car. Nice! We snuck inside and looked around. There was a big safe sitting in the car. You don't suppose the key is the same for this, do ya? I wouldn't count on it. 
We swung around to see Carnage, smiling a big toothy grin at us through the car window. Oh no! We ran outside, and as soon as we did, he charged and we attacked. He projected red spikes and they flew at us. Ouch! He kept shooting. Venom! We are gonna die if we stay! We hurried and ran out of the subway car, Carnage chasing us. We ran up the darkened tunnel, avoiding the red spikes. The subway opened into a chasm, and we ran across the tracks. Venom! One spike struck us in the back, and we fell into the dark chasm, everything blacking out around us. On days 167 to 170, we woke up in darkness, floating in the water. Eddie had taken form. Jeez, I feel like garbage. How fitting, since we're floating in it. We looked around, and sure enough, we were standing in wrappers and bags and other debris. Yuck. We tried to follow the tunnel to where there was a very faint light. We finally reached some bars at the end of the tunnel. It looks like this leads out to the bay. We swam underneath the bars and emerged in the bay. Wait, we need to go back for Bolt. We went back to the address on the key and followed the tunnel down to the subway car. The safe was open, and it was empty. Figures, Cletus took it so that Nim couldn't get to it. I guess Nim didn't realize he had lost the key until it was too late. Poor planning on his part. You got that right, buddy. On days 171 to 174, we made our way back to the factory, or what was left of it. When we got back, though, we were surprised to see it all cleaned up and fixed. Huh? Eddie! Anne ran towards us and gave us a big hug. We've been working to fix the base and make some improvements. Do you like it? We looked around and it was amazing. She had even made a dining area and gotten some other decorations to make it more homey. Wow, you really outdid yourself, Anne. She looked really proud of herself, which she should. She took us to a couple of things that needed lifting and moving that she couldn't do herself. But besides that, it was perfect. Everyone else seemed really happy with how it turned out. We missed you, Eddie. Did you find Nim? Yeah, but he got away. His plan was to steal the lightning weapon, but Maggie foiled that. She's a hero. Zack nodded in agreement. So what's the plan now? I'm not sure. On days 175 to 178, we planted a garden in the back of the factory since everything was getting a bit too gray and red. We even made a basketball court so people could play and exercise. I went out to gather some more food since Zack was still not feeling well and I saw some crooks outside. That looks suspicious. They were holding weapons and guarding some sort of restaurant. Let's go check it out. I morphed and we charged the crooks. They shot, but we dodged them all. Before the crooks knew it, they were defeated and I had a full belly. Mmm, yum. We crept into the restaurant to see Nim trying to grab some people from the back. No, you don't. We charged and he started to shoot at us. This is for Maggie. He grazed us with a couple of bullets, but we didn't stand down. He seemed scared and tried to run into the kitchen. He let go of the people and they ran the other way. Coward! We smashed into the kitchen doors, throwing Nim back onto the floor. Let me go. I've done nothing wrong. That's a lie if I ever did hear one. We swallowed him in one big gulp. At least we don't have to worry about him anymore. Then all of a sudden, I felt my form start to surge with power, and I got bigger. I even gained the rest of my hearts back. Finally! Then my stomach started to rumble really loud. Uh, Venom? What is that? I don't know. Then I let out a huge belch, and something flew out of my mouth. Ah, gross venom. I couldn't help it. I looked at the item I had burped out, and it looked like a key card with a symbol on it. Hmm, this might be important. I don't recognize the symbol. Maybe someone at the factory will. On days 179 to 184, we went back to the factory with a key card. We showed it to a bunch of people, but nobody seemed to know what it was. Wait, let me look at it again. Travis looked at the key card closer. The ink is faded, but it looks familiar. What is it? There's a hospital on the north side of the city that has a symbol on the outside like this. That must be where it goes to. A hospital? I don't even want to know what Cletus is doing in a hospital. Same. Travis shuddered. But the keycard won't work anyway. What? Why do you say that? Part of the security strip is gone. It won't work unless you have that. It must have rubbed off when it was in my stomach. Huh? Um, what? Travis handed us the card back and wiped his hands on his shirt. Gross, my dude. But hey, I know someone who worked in the hospital. She could hook you up. On days 185 to 189, we went to the apartment that Travis told us about. We knocked on the door. A woman with glasses peeked her head out. What do you want? Are you Kai? Who is asking? We're a friend of Travis. He told us you worked at the hospital. Yeah, but Cletus and his goons kicked us all out a few days ago and made us move to the hospital on the southern side of the city. He made us all give up our key cards. My heart sank. But I kept a spare one, just in case. She closed the door and then came back a minute later with a key card. 
It was intact. Yes. If anyone asks, I didn't give it to you. Of course. Thank you. She nodded and closed the door. This was the big break we were looking for. We hurried back to the factory, a spring in our step. On days 190 to 194, we told everyone about the hospital, and they all agreed to help out to make sure the factory was ready, just in case there was an ambush again. We all gathered more people off the street and made them places to stay. While out, I made sure to fight off as many crooks as possible. I gathered food for later and even managed to find some chocolate in a nearby dumpster. Gross, Venom. You can't eat dumpster chocolate. Eddie, I literally eat people, and you think that dumpster chocolate is gross? Your priorities are not in the right order. Ah, shut it. I morphed out of him and slugged him in the shoulder, softly. Uh-huh, sure. Punch the guy who takes care of you. I patted him on the head instead. I think I preferred the punch. On days 195 to 197, we finished the statue. We stopped to look at it on the roof of the factory. It was pretty fantastic. Almost good enough to eat. Hey, Eddie. We turned and saw Anne. I just wanted to say thank you for everything. I don't know what I'd do without you. Yeah, Venom is pretty great. I'm not talking about Venom. I'm talking about you. Then she gave Eddie a kiss, but this time it wasn't on the cheek. I felt his face get really, really red, but then he smiled really big. Have I told you how much I like you? On day 198, we traveled to the hospital with the key card in hand. It did look abandoned, just like Kai said, but there was one room that seemed to glow a bit ominously. I don't like that. Me neither, buddy. We swiped the key card, which opened up doors as we progressed inside. It was pretty dark as we made our way to the room with the light. The door was open, and we peeked inside. Is that? Oh no. Carnage stood with not one, but two other smaller symbiotes. I think we should retreat. It's too late for that. We flipped around to see another symbiote behind us. How many are there? The symbiote charged at us, and we had no choice but to run inside the room with all the other symbiotes. On day 199, we ran into the room with Carnage and his smaller symbiotes. You've met my children? Huh? Children? I looked closer and realized that all the other symbiotes were all just lighter shades of red. Uh -oh. Eddie, this is not good. No duh, Venom. Now that you're here, we can make more of my followers. He held up a large knife with jagged edges. Then I noticed something sitting in the corner of the room. It was Bolt. Yes. This ends here, Carnage. We charged at him, but at the last second, we veered toward the corner. Stop him! The symbiotes ran after me, a few of them getting some swipes in. Luckily, they were smaller, so they didn't do nearly as much damage. I managed to grab the lightning weapon and shoot it at the first symbiote. It screamed for a moment, then exploded into a puddle. No! I aimed at the next symbiote, and just like its brother, it turned to goof. My children! I took aim at the last symbiote. It screamed in pain before exploding. How dare you! I was about to aim at Carnage when he shot his red spikes at us. I had to duck down and before I knew it, Carnage was right in front of us. He knocked me away and I lost grip on the lightning weapon. Die, you traitor! Then, I felt the puddles of the symbiotes start to pool around me. They morphed into my form, making me grow larger with each one. What is happening? They are returning to their rightful place of origin, Carnage. I felt the symbiotes merge fully, and I grew into a huge venom with a long tongue and even bigger claws. No! I grabbed for the lightning weapon, but Carnage put up a fight. He tried to shoot it at me, but with my body's restored speed, I could easily avoid most of the electricity. I noticed he was getting more and more angry with each shot that I dodged. You won't win! Bolt will incinerate you! He suddenly shot a huge volley of red spikes all over the place. I lunged towards him, knocking the lightning weapon out of his hands. He reached for it, but I was faster. I snatched it off the floor and pointed it at him. Goodbye, Cletus. I pulled the trigger, the electricity pulsing through the lightning weapon into the red symbiote. He screamed and started melting into a red puddle on the floor before evaporating into a brilliant burst of light. On day 200, we returned triumphantly to the factory with Bolt waving above our head. Everyone cheered as we approached. It was good to know that the city would be safe again, free from monsters and criminals. Everyone insisted that we stay for a little while longer before heading back to our city. We agreed, happy to have another place to call home.